So welcome everyone. This is the opportunity to grow pitch session. We're so delighted to have all of you here today. Um, we have 14 finalists today that have been selected from a global competition uh, that we've been having for over the past few months. And some have traveled as far as the United States to come, Sweden, across the region, and India. So I'm really thrilled that we're gonna start today um, with these amazing women entrepreneurs. And I wanted to introduce our judges here today. We've got, we've got uh, six judges at the moment in the room, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. I'll go in this, or this order, so you all know where they're coming from. Um, what's really great about these women entrepreneurs is now they have unprecedented access to capital from various industries, uh, not just from the region, but from other parts of the world. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves today and um, tell you a little bit about the funds that they're running and the types of, um, types of sectors that they're investing in. Okay, so I'll start with uh, An Anvita. Hi, everyone. Do you have a mic? Is there a mic with you? Not really, but can everyone hear? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Anu, for inviting me. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I'm Anvita, and uh, I'm running uh, Dubai Angel Investors Fund, um, which is actually focused on early stage startups and also the focus is international not just this region um, and along with that I also advise some uh, family offices on investments and prior I was the CEO of Dubizel and OLX from Middle East and Africa and I've also managed an e-commerce company Lazada in Southeast Asia. Fantastic. I'd like to introduce Virginia Tan next who's here from Beijing, China and Virginia could you please tell us a little bit about your background here from when you were in Dubai and what you're doing now. Absolutely. Delighted to be here and a hard act to follow. Um, uh, my name is Virginia. Um, I used to be a finance lawyer for many years and I actually spent, uh, I was based in London, but I, I actually spent a year here in Dubai in 2011. Um, currently, I'm based in Beijing. I moved there to uh, represent Chinese state-owned companies and banks on One Belt, One Road investments in the emerging markets. Uh, along the way, we built uh, Lean in China, which is now uh, one of the largest uh, women development nonprofits in China. And I am also uh, the co-founder of She Loves Tech, which is um, a global uh, women in tech startup competition. Uh, this year we were in eight countries. Next year I hope to be in more countries, including the Emirates. Uh, and I'm also in the process of, uh, of, of building a, a gender lens fund. Thank you. Fantastic. Mireille. Thank you. Um, my name is Mireille Zaki. I um, have been a personal global investor in uh, both startups and uh, growth capital in late stage um, for the past 10 years. By background, I'm a medical doctor and an engineer. Um, but then I did an MBA and CFA and made the glorious shift into the world of finance um, or, you know, sin, if you want to call that too. Um, and um, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Heba. Heba number one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hebeli Mara. I work for an international fiduciary company called Vistra. Um, we have various business lines, but we support entrepreneurs, um, small and medium-sized enterprises to expand globally. So don't just think locally, think globally. Good luck, everyone. Fantastic. Hoda Jamra. Hi, thank you. Dear friend of mine. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me to be here. My name is Hoda Jamra, and I'm uh, part of TVM Capital. Uh, MENA, we invest in healthcare, um, a growth capital within the MENA region, India, and Southeast Asia. Thank you. Fantastic. Haba number two. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Hebel Habashi. I work for FTL, which is Fashion Tech Lab. I'm the CEO of their MENA office. Uh, so FTL invests in everything related to material science, so nanotech, biotech. Our investments are region agnostic, so they're all over the world. We have investments from labs in the States to Shenzhen to Moscow. Um, and yeah, happy to be here. Excellent. So how many of, are, of you here are investors in the audience? Could you raise your hands, please? Just say, entrepreneurs, let's raise your hand if you're entrepreneurs. Wonderful, 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 awesome, excellent. You're raising your hand too. <laughs> excellent. Okay, so we should just get started. Um, the format of this is we're gonna let everybody um, who's been selected as a finalist pitch for three minutes 
And then there will be a five minute uh, curate moderated um, Q&A. So you're also invited to ask questions and participate. But we're going to ask our first pitch company to come forward. It's Adrienne Weir from Medilac. And she happens to live not too far from me. So come on up, Adrienne. And Adrienne was actually uh, one of the featured portfolio companies at this year's TechCrunch Disrupt. So get ready, be blown away. Thank you so much, Anu. And um, actually, Alina Meadow is my co-founder at Meadowlack Laboratories and also happens to be my mother. And so we are here to talk to you today about human milk and um, how creating a standardized uh, shelf-stable product can save the lives of preterm infants around the world. So the prob Hello? Okay. <laughs> the problem uh, worldwide for 15 million preterm babies is that quite often they're separated by their, from their mothers when they're transported to regional children's hospitals. And second to that, preterm babies need more protein <coughs> than human milk offers. So traditionally they've given cow's milk protein to add to that so they can have normal brain and, and uh, lean body mass development. But the cow milk fortifier raises the risk of a fatal disease called necrotizing enterocolitis, which causes them to get gangrene of the gut. And it's a terrible way to die. It's a terrible way to live as well for babies who survive because often they lose 80% of their gut and their, the healthcare costs and the personal costs is tremendous. So we came up with a solution. Milk banks around the world offer a frozen non-sterile um, solution to the need for human milk in the neonatal intensive care unit. But there were many stumbling blocks around using that product, including cold chain supply, overnight shipping, high cost, and a non-sterile product. So we um, worked together to design a more effective solution, which is shelf-stable, standardized, and homogenized. And we are a growth stage company that's currently supplying the, all of the leading hospitals in the United States with this product to meet their feeding needs. Um, in the neonatal nutrition market, we're known as the sort of the global innovators who can solve the toughest problems for the NICU. So there's only one other company in the world that processes human milk at very high volumes professionally, and it's a company we started in 1999. Um, they were looking for an exit and not innovation. And so in 2009, we left, and we decided we could do something better. So on the top of the list of how we do things better is we're a public benefit corporation. And so our main concern is to increase access. And we've just produced our first public benefit audit report um, that measures how we have done. And that includes the carbon footprint because when we're not shipping frozen product, we're shipping by ground and it reduces uh, the carbon footprint substantially, enough to power several hundred houses even though we're only in our first two years of revenue. Um, it's a billion dollar market in the US. Uh, globally, because there's humanitarian markets and commercial markets, depends on how you measure that, but there's 15 million preterm infants who all could use the, uh, this product in addition to their mother's own milk. Yes, are we moving to questions, Anu? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we're going to start with Heba. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks a lot for your time. I had a few questions just to understand a bit more. Mm -hmm. So what is the exact process of getting the milk from the mother right. and sterilizing it and all of that? Like, how does it work exactly? Yeah. And then where do you, like, end up paying the mom and etc.? cetera? Yeah, so we have, um, we have two uh, companies that are partners. It's a producer processor model. Um, so our milk bank is a cooperative milk bank where the milk donors are actually members and they can be paid if they wish to be paid. So actually since our launch in 2013, we've paid out approximately 1.5 million to women across the United States who've participated in the program. They have to have their blood screened, the milk is then screened, and they have to meet a, um, uh, fill out a medical history questionnaire to make sure that they're suitable donors. And um, when their milk is qualified by our in-house uh, food safety lab, um, then they're actually able to be paid after that. So they collect their milk in their home once they've passed the screening process, and we ship them an insulated shipping container to fill it full of their okay. frozen milk. And so what stops hospitals from working with the donation centers directly? 
Um, so we we are actually the if donation center. So we collect the milk from oh, the mothers, okay. and then um, it's tested, packaged, and processed. And there's release testing criteria as well to make sure that it's commercially sterile and that it's a safe product. And I, I was talking to one of the other entrepreneurs here yesterday, and that they had mentioned that this is a common practice here in, in the Emirates to, to share milk, so excellent. Thank you. Does anyone have any more comments, either in the audience, the judges? Hoda, please. Um, yeah, quick question. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. The time was very short for you to say it's very, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of interesting thing more that you would like to share with us. Um, have you sold outside of the U.S.? And my second question are what are the regulatory challenges you would face if in other markets? Are, the, are you food? Are you OTC product? What are you regulated under? Yes, yeah, so within the United States, we're actually regulated two ways. So on a federal level, we're regulated as a food. And in three states, we're regulated as a human tissue. And we are a licensed tissue bank, yes. <laughs> and um, globally, um, it's a bit um, of a gray area. So there's a lack of regulations. And um, we actually move toward um, sort of that space so that we can raise the bar for safety and quality and establish good guidelines. So have you checked what? What is the regulation in the Middle East, for example, um, or not yet? And do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. In most places, there are no regulations in that human milk is not legally a food based on, f on legal statutes. And so we're advocating for that um, in, in general with the um, criticality of the preterm babies. Generally, there's no barrier to getting the product into the country but it just takes the work to have it be done, and it's a humanitarian type thing. And we do ship to um, American military hospitals around the world. There were, there were two more questions that I saw. I'm gonna start, Anvita, you still had one or no? Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to really understand, like, are there any kind of like compatibility issues from the mother's milk to the babies, or it's just like completely um, yeah. safe? No, it's not like blood where you have to have the typing and the compatibility. And so any mother can provide her milk to any baby. And, um, and so we, we do think that there's a significant regional global issue because the native foods actually create um, a flavor in the milk that trains the baby to like that type of food and also the immune factors. So it's nice to have a, a regional um, supply for that reason. But some generally cultures, speaking, uh, some of the cultures and countries, right? It's also very um, family and friends, like close uh, relatives, which kind of substitute this need. Have you also really thought of like positioning? How you're going to position your product in such markets or cultures? Yes, and and because human milk only provides about 25 percent of the protein needed for preterm babies to have normal brain development. What we're really promoting in those areas is a supplement to add to mother's own milk to bring the protein up, but keep it consistent with human milk, um, the species-specific as aspect of human milk. So this, this session, the whole purpose of the design of this session was to give women entrepreneurs access to capital, access to collaborations, access to partners. And I want to ask you, because what your needs are right now in terms of what, you know, if you're raising a note or if you're looking for partners, this is your time to ask. And then I'm gonna take your question once we're done with that. So why don't you tell us what would be most helpful for you? Go ahead. Okay, so we've raised to date um, about $5 million. We've built uh, our initial pilot plant and, um, I and proven the concept and beyond um, with about a little over a million, 1.2 million in revenue this last year. Um, approaching profitability and the introduction of three new products. And so we're raising the, uh, we set out to raise um, 5 million. We've raised 3.75 of that. And that's through a convertible note that pays 5% interest with a two year, uh, a two year maturity. And then um, the trigger for conversion is a $7 million Series C um, Fantastic. offering. Fantastic. And your question, and then we're going to move on to the next. Do you have a mic? Can we give them a mic, please? Thank you. I just want to ask that why do you want to, uh, um, you said 15 million. For me, I mean, this product can be given to any, any uh, baby or any infant because that's the most natural thing, and that's what all the infant formula milk companies, which is currently available, they advocate that the mother's milk is the best milk. Mm -hmm. Nobody can argue that. So why do you want to limit your market? Is this... 
is there a because I, I believe that you would have a sourcing challenges as well I mean uh, from from uh, from that side yeah a market should not be a problem okay, okay. Um, we don't have any we're not supply limited well, in fact the converse has been true that women and it could be unique to the United States because we have very poor maternity leaves or practically no maternity leave and so women are looking for a way to stay home with their children a little bit longer and be able to offset the cost. So if they can, the average donor makes about $800 a month. And um, if they can net what they would normally net, they don't have to replace their whole pay, just the amount that they would net if they went back to work. So yes, we'd love to serve a consumer market, but on a humanitarian basis, and again, we're public benefits, so we consider the social impact of what we do. And so on a pr priority basis, we need to serve the most vulnerable children first. Fantastic. Thank you, Madalak. Thank you. Okay. So that's an example of women investing in women. Fantastic. And it can be scaled globally, and has scaled globally, I should say. Um, our next entrepreneur is Ajaita Shah. I met Ajaita in India, and she just won the Global Entrepreneurship Summit pitch competition. and. She's based in Jaipur, India, and she's gonna, we're going to switch gears now. We went from health, now we're going to go to energy. So, Ajaita, could you please come up? Hi, everyone. I will first make sure that there's only one slide that we're watching while I'm pitching. Um, so, I have been uh, working in India for the last decade, and I've worked in over 5,000 villages in rural India, and each time I've witnessed rural households suffer from darkness, fear, and instability. I've seen mothers lose their home and their children in like a spick of a minute due to kerosene fires. Now, while we know that clean energy solutions could potentially solve this issue, you need relevant, reliable solutions to reach rural households faster. So what I did with Frontier Markets is we set up a scalable, proven business model which puts w women in the center of the value chain. We work with NGO partners to recruit women that earn zero income to date and now train them in technical training, marketing, as well as technology, and get them to sell innovative solar products to rural households to earn an income. Till date, we've had 1,000 women entrepreneurs who've helped sell 400,000 solutions to households in Rajasthan, earning a total income of $2.5 million. These women today are now bank worthy. They're actually part of the formal economy. And now they're also even helping us through a mobile platform, get more customer insights to innovate products at scale. So what kind of innovation? Solar TVs, agri appliances that are all locally manufactured that they're bringing to market. What we are now doing because of these women, they've helped us break even as a company, um, generating 46% gross profit margins. And now we're raising $2 million of growth capital to scale this to six states of India to generate $26 million of revenue and actually create 10,000 women entrepreneurs that will be working with over 21 million households, constantly thinking about product innovation and earning income. You know, the power of getting women into a financial inclusion system is beyond incredible because they are the center of the home and the family. When they're economically empowered, they help their children get into better schools. They think about a better life. You know, I want to leave you with a very simple thought that one of our women entrepreneurs had said to me, Savitra Bai from Junjunu. She said, you know, thanks to you, I'm now the center of my family, the center of my village. I am in control and I see a light and I see a hopeful future for my child. Join me in proving that investing in women is smart business and the key to poverty alleviation at scale. Thank you. Under three. No? Okay. Um, it's back again. Wonderful. So let's start with questions from the, the audience first. Okay. I saw some eye eyes perk up. Okay. Who would like to ask the first question? So, okay. We'll go to the judges then. Uh, there's the question. Oh, there's right one there. here. Yes. Go ahead. One second. One second. Uh, how did you come up uh, with the idea uh, to work with uh, these spheres of business? Uh, because sure, absolutely. you're a woman and we're a little bit far away from that uh, field. Sure, uh, great question. Um, so I grew, up in I grew up in America, but I moved to India 13 years ago, um, and I started my journey in microfinance. 
So microfinance was a very interesting model that was about scaling financial services to women because we knew that women were very good at handling money and were actually very good at using money to optimize their business. Working in that space for six years, I, that's how I kind of really worked deeply into rural India in over 10 states of India. And I recognize the clear challenge is you can't just give financial services to someone and expect them to succeed. There's a lot of other challenges you need to deal with. And energy access was one of the major ones that I witnessed myself. And so ultimately for me, it was if I want to give a woman a sewing machine to earn income, she better have power so that she can actually utilize it to its maximum capacity. So there were all these key insights that I recognized that said, you know, let's create a market based solution showing that investing in women will get us quicker scale of energy access, but also think about it in a way where we're co-creating with our rural households and giving them that voice. Thank you. Fantastic. Questions. Okay, let's go to Virginia and then Marie. Great, great pitch, I loved Thanks. it. Um, so I want to know, how do you intend to scale? So for, for example, sure. you say that you, know, you work with NGOs, but how do you intend to scale on a cost efficient basis and across, you know, and tell me where you want to scale to? Absolutely, so six states in India. Uh, today we're in Rajasthan, to just give you some numbers. Rajasthan's market is 1.12 million households. 400,000 means we have more than 30% penetration at a deep scale, which actually gave us that pull market understanding of customer cost acquisition. And what it turns out is that when you think about the deepness of how we go to understand that rural household, a farmer is a farmer is a farmer. And you understand agri-household needs in a very different way, which gives you an entry point to new states. The six states we want to expand into are Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Orissa, that are all still a part of that northern belt that we understand as a common culture and language. Our biggest partner that we announced is Barefoot College who has pretty incredible presence in the last 40 years of training NGOs to bring women into engineering. Their challenge was they're not having their women earn income. So we've actually been leveraging our understanding of our partners. I worked in microfinance. We've kind of lined out all of our partners that we want to be working with in these six states. We've done our mapping already to understand what the markets are. It's 287,000, 287 million households. And we also were able to recognize which products can be standardized to enter. Key way of scaling, however, is technology. So our mobile platform is what we've been working on. We've actually partnered with Geo, which is the largest 4G connectivity company in India, to bring internet connectivity to the last mile, and also smart feature phones, which will allow us to integrate a much more robust operational, technical, and digital platform to so, scale. So, so just in terms of numbers, let's talk about customer acquisition costs. So sure. let's say, um, I mean, I, I saw that you guys are already, you know, uh, kind of like making revenue and stuff. So how, how much does it cost to, let's say, gain a new consumer, given you have sure. to train them, blah, 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 blah. Sure. So uh, a new women entrepreneur, to train her, the cost today is $500. We see an ROI of investing in her in two and a half years. And we see significant profitability, actually, by the third year. So we've not just generated revenue. We've broken even as a company, um, which is the first. We're the first ever last mile company to break even. Um, our customer cost acquisition is an interesting one. So the first customer in a new state, the acquisition cost is around $25. However, that customer, because they're working with the women entrepreneur, builds trust and word of mouth. So that one customer cost acquisition leads to 15 new customers. So actually, over three months, our customer cost acquisition goes down from 25 to around $2. It's pretty significant in terms of the overall period. Also, we look at customer ROI in terms of not today, but actually the five-year horizon. So basically, the customer today that buys a solar lantern is then buying a power system, is then buying a TV, is buying an agri-appliance. So you're actually working with them for a lifelong value. And your model is, to me, B to C to C, because you have the women entrepreneurs in the middle. Correct. So you talked about $500, right? So, I mean, that's your training costs, and then by yeah. the third year, they make profit. So, so Absolutely. So run me through that. So, so of the 46% gross profit margin that we earn, so the key is 46% for our sector is massively high, yep. knowing that it's locally Indian manufactured that gives us our strength, exclusivity, higher yep. gross profit margin, good quality. Um, we pass 20% to the women. Okay. So we keep 26% margins to actually cover our marketing costs, customer acquisition, logistics distribution. Um, and they are earning 20% off of product sales, Plus, they're earning a fixed income on the work that they're doing. So they're using these mobile phones to collect data. So imagine if I look at a market of a village of 5,000 households. Her goal is to give me data about everyone. 
So I'm helping think about the pull market of where so she's going. So you paid them a salary. Income. What do you mean fixed income? How, how does Her that fixed work? income is around $100 um, a month. As in, okay, as in you pay them? Yes. Okay, interesting. Okay, super. So you're, you're here in the Emirates. Yes. What kind of partners are you looking for and how, how can they actually partner with you? And then Maria, I'll take your question. Sure. Um, so we really are looking for more innovative financing partners. Um, there are two ways that we're looking at this. One is for straight equity capital to be able to just grow our business and expand. But the second is also working capital. We really want to start bringing, building credit history for our women that we can actually then be able to access more direct capital to them, because that's the scale, that's what makes this so interesting. And you um, have data and analytics. And we have data and analytics that. that allows us to really build that momentum. So we need partners that can help us grow that for the next two years to really take this to scale. Awesome, Mary? Two questions for you. One is uh, valuation, how are you thinking about that? And mm -hmm. two is really about your projections. Um, you've been growing at 50% uh, for the past couple of years. You're breaking even on EBITDA level this year, but you're coming forecasting 100% growth for the next year and then 300, 400% growth the year Correct. after. Correct. What's, what's causing this step function? Sure. So uh, one major thing is early on, it was all about business model innovation and not cracking it. Mm -hmm. We've stayed in one state for the last six years. Mm -hmm. We're now expanding to six over time. And like I said, we're going from 1.1 million households to 287 million potential households that we're expanding to. Um, because of our model, I come from a microfinance background, so the goal is to always incubate, perfect, and then blow it up. Um, and that's really what's really growing the number. So if you look at it, you know, the, the, the assumptions are still the same. It's, 100, it's, w it's one woman to 100 households. She's just selling more effectively. Second uh, point uh, that we wanted to make was that because of the integration of new products, you're actually seeing a higher value of revenue coming in. So you're moving from lanterns and home lighting systems to like now solar TVs agri appliances that, a higher, that have a higher value, hence the revenue growing up more significantly. And we're tracking our CAGR based on that. So on our main assumptions, actually conversion rates are still tiny. It's just that the market is so big. Rajasthan was a scattered market, and this is a much more crowded market in terms of the states that we're operating in. Quickly on the valuation, uh, last financial year performance, uh, uh, sorry, projected financial year performance of this year with a four and a half X multiplier is what we're setting with our investors. So roughly so you're around. Negative EBITDAs. Sorry? You're forecasting ne negative EBITDAs. What are you multiplying against the re revenues? We're multiplying against revenues, exactly. So it's track record, revenues, and re growth potential. So last, the last time we did an equity raise was around a similar principle. And uh, now, because it's growth capital and we're seeing the growth based on our track record doable, uh, that's where our valuation is. Last question, if no. I may. Okay. Got to get be fair Sorry. now. Okay. Follow up with Thank you. Later. Yes, absolutely. Ajaita. Thank you so much. Thank you. Got an investor wanting to talk more. That's great. Um, Aisha Khan, where are you? Awesome. And Aisha is actually right here. We're going from India now to the United Arab Emirates. So I'm going to let you jump in. Tell us about your company. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And uh, let me start with the truth that the speakers before me were awesome. I really don't think I can talk that well, but I'll just share my little story with all of you. I've been in the Emirates for a very long time. I, since after 1996, honestly, I've been here. But then uh, what have I come up with is secure living. I am an IT professional for a long time. I want the second slide on. I don't have a means to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Uh, in a different dress, of course. Okay. Uh, let me tell you something about a secure living. What I mean is, I've been an IT professional doing ISO compliance audit, where IT security was what I was into, where I used to go to organizations and judge their IT security maturity level and find out the loopholes where I can protect my clients. But when they used to come back to tell me that what do you do when somebody just walks into the organization and records all the vocal, verbal communications of classified informations. Does your IT compliance address that? Or if one of my client who's into automobiles, they're discussing or having a demonstration done, somebody's doing a video recording, even before the product is launched, it's sold out, the idea is gone. What do you do for that? So I, I didn't have an answer for that. So what, what I got into is not being able to handle my client's requirements although I was good at audits. But then I was really not good at helping them out 
that put me into a thought process that I need to help them with their actual problems and come up with some real solutions. And that's what this is. We've come up with devices which are going to now stop any kind of physical data theft. This is one domain which has not been explored. It's my experience because I have already exhibited all my machines in Jitex where people from 97 countries had come in, 150,000 audience who really told me that this is something not explored. For example, one of the machines there, that tall uh, cop thing, it can be put at the entrance of any university examination hall and the students, if they are carrying any mobile phones, even in switched off mode, the machine can detect it. So now, no more just asking them, don't bring your mobile phones, no copying, no need. Put one machine and you're sorted. Or you can go in for another device, which I brought one of my devices with me, I'll show it to you, which can identify any data transmission in a meeting room where classified confidential discussion is happening. It could be a government sector office, it could be a large private sector enterprise, where my machine will detect any data recording or transmission and stop it. So now, there is no need to just keep on chasing people and trying to prevent them from doing any copying, recording, or data theft. Put a machine and you're sorted. The other live example is film piracy. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. How much more do you have? Um, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Let's give her 30 seconds. OK, keep thank going. you. So film piracy was one domain that I was discussing, where people sit in the cinema halls and record a movie and take it off. So that kind of theft also can be prevented. So we have a large range of machines that we have just come up. I spent over a year doing this research, and that's how the machines are here with us now. Based on our exhibitions, we have got orders. What we're looking at is now basing ourselves in Sharjah, because this is a concept born in Sharjah. I want it to be in Sharjah. Wonderful. Thank you for Thank that. You. Thank you. And what are you looking for specifically today? Specifically, I'm looking for, uh, since I already have orders in hand, and uh, the orders are mostly from 70% from the government sector. And uh, the reason why I'm here is I'm looking for a woman uh, sub, uh, support, uh, an investor, who would help me take this further. Because I want it to be based in Sharjah. That's my primary requirement. And from here, take it to the world. So gl global expansion as well as an... Uh, it's, is yeah, it is for. expansion okay. because I want to serve the immediate clients which are on hand. Okay. Fantastic. So let's start with our judges. Hoda? Thank you very much. This is Thank a great you. story. Um, is there any similar product internationally or this is the first, I mean, what I'll is the competitive? You, uh, yeah, there? let me be honest here because I've done enough survey before coming into this and I was really very scared to go for the Jitex because I didn't know if something like this existed. So I uh, did a research to find out if people are talking about physical data theft. No, everybody is looking inside the network. There is so much happening within the IT network. People have antivirus, people have anti-hacking devices, technology. Think about a system administrator who works in your data center. He or she has the permission to enter your data center. You have a camera on, but he or she takes a picture of the database that's open. Does, do, do they need a password for that? They don't. They being authorized professionals can still take the data out. Now this is from one of the leading telecom organizations. I would not like to name it. They said, I, sh I need something to protect from my own people. This is happening. So why not put machines and protect the organization's data? Because information security is really crucial these days. Anvita. Yes. Um, so I want to understand, like, how do you differentiate personal data transmission with professional data transmission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has uh, really been uh, coming up very quite often when I discuss my devices. We are discussing exclusively the uh, identify or the de designated classified information detailing areas. Could be a, a conference room, could be a court session, could be an examination hall, could be any meeting room where it is designated that nobody is supposed to take data out or nobody is even supposed to record. But then, these days, everybody, have, uh, everybody has a smartphone at least, maybe two, uh, if, if not uh, more. 
So we can't prevent people from bringing their personal devices for meetings. They are dignitaries. And if it has already been announced and asked that they are not supposed to do it, people still continue to do it. We need to have our own precaution. These machines are more of self-defense because we are trying to only protect our data. And these particular machines are not in any ways going to interrupt with any of the people's personal devices. So you're going to tag the information? No, we only protect it. How do we do it is we have the radio frequencies identified, we sense those, and if somebody is trying to record the data, they can record it now and send it later. We will not permit that. We will interrupt between their recording and storage into their own device. We will not be accessing their device in any ways. All what we are doing is for that designated duration of the meeting, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, the machines will be on and they will protect what's happening inside that area. Fantastic. We geofence that particular area, so please do not consider that if the machine is on, the entire office is locked. No, it's just that meeting area or that designated area. Fida, you had a question. Do we have a mic for her, please? Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Hi. So um, just a couple of questions. Yes. Um, so what's the approximate addressable market size that you're targeting, whether here or the in the near future? And then where are you assembling those machines? And uh, What's the um, cost and profit that if you've done any financial uh, Yeah, le let me, uh, well, I do not have the exact numbers to tell you that this machine uh, would, or this range of machines would cost this much because each of my machine has a different expense to build. We have already built it. I only have demo machines with me as of now. And for addressing the client needs, which is not only UAE, I have already got orders and uh, very keen potential clients from all over Asia. So it's the entire Middle East, of course, and all the Asian countries. I definitely did the conceptualization and integration here. But then for having the cosmetization done for the machines, I had to rely on factories outside UAE with whom I have got the NDA signed up so that they don't take my ideas outside. And I developed the machine. So yes, I do have factories where I have to depend on them because I don't have a factory of my own. Wonderful. One more question, and then we're going to move on to our next panel. So maybe I have another one. Sure. Go for yes. it. Yes. Jump in. Thank you for that. Um, two really quick, quick, quick ones. Uh, does the machine selectively choose whether there's a huge surge in uploads or downloads during the meeting, or does it? So basically, does it map the normal frequency uh, usage out of the bandwidth, and then it maps what's more? above that and then cuts it off? Or no. is it just, it doesn't discriminate, it's more generic? It doesn't, I'll tell you why. Okay. Because uh, in a particular designated meeting area where we are now only discussing meeting areas, if Understood. at all, then it's the anything, whether it's 2G, 3G, 4G, a Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, anything that has a capacity to either store data and or transmit data mm -hmm. is a risk. Okay. If at all there is a classified information being discussed, Understood. everything is a risk. Understood. So this does not classify. It identifies, it. I can even show you my machine, where it exactly shows you that what kind of frequency is identified, where, which machine, and we can ask them to give it back, submit it back, if at all something like that is Excellent. happening. Do you have any patents? That's why you've got uh, orders coming from yes. all over the world. Okay, uh, patents. Do you have any patents? Uh, yes, I have only done uh, a simple pattern, not the, uh, the serious one, because yeah, I didn't have funds for that. So I just did a provisional patenting. Talk to me later. Okay. Sorry, wants just to the last question. I, I'm, I'm quite yes. curious. <laughs> yes. Is um, so uh, you say that you stop the transmission of data, but recording, recording also, because people can just record the data now and then transmit later. Yes, that's, that's what not I permitted, my dear. Because when it's uh, uh, we have already in, uh, informed the audience that they are not supposed to take out this proprietary information. If they record it now, it doesn't make sense. They can always transmit it later. So what we do is we interfere in their frequency of the transmission towards the, uh, into their own hard drives or whichever the device they are carrying, and we stop it right there. So yes, we interfere in that particular saving. So if you transmit now, you think, I mean, say I would be in a meeting room, I think I have uh, copied all the data or recorded everything for 30 minutes, I go back to my office and check, yeah. it's either corrupted or blank. Good. Fantastic. Aisha, thank you. Thank you. Danielle Kayembe, now we're moving to New York City. Um, Danielle, Danielle is working with underrepresented uh, women entrepreneurs, getting them funded, and uh, she's got to focus on Africa. So please. Okay, hi everyone. Timer's over there, okay, great. 
Um, and I have the clicker. Okay, great. Ah. Okay, great. Uh, so I am Danielle Kayembe. I'm the CEO and founder of Greyfire Impact. Uh, we really believe that we can change the world by working at the intersection of women, social impact, and technology. So we work across three areas. I'm going to go through this really quickly because I have so much I want to cover. Um, we're focused on supporting female-led startups. Um, companies and we're now moving into research and data. Um, so as many of you know, if you work on projects around women, women, at least right now, receive about 2% of venture capital funding. Women of color receive 0.2% um, compared to men. Men raise one and a half million dollars. Women of color typically receive about $36,000. So um, what we do, um, we focus on helping women of color who are founders raise money. Uh, we have a huge focus on Africa, or women who are focused on African markets. Um, and we focus on women who have um, an interest essentially in social impact. So if they are um, essentially creating platforms that are empowering and uh, creating opportunities for women in Africa, we tend to support them. Um, we raised a uh, quarter of a million dollars this year for a company called Tastemakers Africa, uh, which is a curated travel platform. Um, and they essentially, um, in terms of impact, they are empowering local youth um, and making opportunities to essentially kind of preserve local cultures and support artisans. Um, two other companies we've worked with, uh, one called Zuva, which has about $2 million in earnings every year. And in terms of the women they work with, um, the African women they support are able to make um, in one day with Zuva what they would probably make in a year on their own um, selling in their local markets in Africa. Um, in terms of the companies that we work with, we try to um, help them essentially connect to ecosystems of underrepresented founders um, in Africa. So for example, um, we did a um, large engagement with Microsoft uh, earlier this summer, and we essentially helped to incubate and create um, support and investor workshops for groups of social impact founders that they were incubating in Nigeria. Um, so I, um, the third area that we work on is research and data, and this came out of a white paper that I released earlier this year, which is called The Silent Rise of the Female Driven Economy. And I essentially talk about um, kind of some kind of new concepts. So I talk about um, coded patriarchy, women-centered innovation, and the female driven economy. So coded patriarchy is just the idea that most of the things we interact with are actually designed by men and for men. And so as women, we are kind of socialized to be uncomfortable with a lot of the things we interact with. So whether it's um, the fact that most women can't use their iPhone one-handed, um, or that doors are heavier for women to walk through, and that's because they're actually designed for the tensile strength of an average man. Excellent. Can I go a little further? Uh, 30 seconds, I'll go to very be fair. Quickly. Um, okay, so essentially we realize that there's a huge opportunity around female entrepreneurs who are creating products and services for, specifically for women. And this made us realize um, that because women are 85% of consumers, um, because they purchase for themselves, their partners, their children, and then the elderly parents they take care of, um, this meant that all the business decisions that are being made are being made based on the best data available, which actually excludes women. So we realize that the next area we want to focus on is that. And so we've actually partnered with um, a, an incredible scientist who's focused on research on women. She has actually been able to create four billion in value for okay. Fortune 500 companies. So that is the third area that we're focused on. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, where are we gonna start? Virginia wants to start and then Hoda. Let's do it. My question is very quick. Um, what is your, are you looking for money? <coughs> Okay, so and what's your business model? How are you making money? Sure. So the area that we are um, interested in raising for is specifically the research and data section. Uh, so we want to essentially build that out, and um, in order to do it the right way, we need to bring in like the right experts across finance, tech, machine learning, and AI. So just making sure that we have kind of that proper piece. Um, the other part of it is that. 
Specifically, when you're doing research for women, what we realize is because women are socialized to be uncomfortable, you can't just ask women what they like or what they want. You actually have to have a, pr a system of de essentially deprogramming women in order to actually get like the real insights and generate the real data. Um, so that is essentially what the scientist that we've been working with has created. So we actually need to go through a series of um, IP protections and kind of legal. So all of those pieces um, is what are, we're essentially kind of looking for investment to create. Um, so we have been approached by a major tech company that would want to back it, but we would prefer to stay independent and have it woman controlled. Great. Virginia, you had a question? I, I think the question was Okay, possible. awesome. Um, anyone else on this side have a question? This side? One more? Okay. Um, the second question is, what's your business model? How are you making money? Um, on which piece of the business? So the, okay, so in terms of the um, working with startups, that is really what we are essentially very passionate about. So for that, we do um, a combination of, you know, taking a percentage of what we raise, um, taking sometimes an equity stake, um, and then we do, we'll do kind of a la carte services. So if they need help building decks or projection models, that kind of thing. And then we offset that with the corporate work where we'll do engagements that are you know, anywhere from one to three hundred thousand dollars for a six to twelve month engagement, um, and then the research will be a new stream of income. Fantastic. Actually, one more. my my question follows that. I, I want to know in particular how you monetize, how you want to monetize the data and analytics piece. I think to me that is actually the piece which is the most scalable. Actually, it is but insane. <laughs> It is, into, it is so, yeah, that is so exciting. Um, we see applications across um, so many different areas because basically every major company does not have good information when it comes to understanding women or engaging with them. But, what, but, sorry. But, but what, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to like sell the research? Are you going to get so, sponsored? Like how, yeah, how so there's, yeah, so I think that one piece of it would be to actually essentially build out research that companies could purchase. Um, the model that we have has predictive capabilities, so we can actually, we have predictive modeling, so we can help them figure, kind of identify new markets. So that would be at a premium over your standard research. Um, and then we have additional applications to like AI and machine learning that would, again, so in terms of scale and the numbers are big. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, the next company is from Scandinavia. It's from Sweden. This is Ebba Charlotta Mantel, and she will be talking to us about My Heart Bear. Here we go. Hi there. I'm so happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is it okay? How many of you are away from your loved ones right now? It all started more than 15 years ago. I was away from my loved one, my six-year-old son, Leo. I was working for the telecom giant Ericsson and was on a business trip in Caracas, Venezuela. I was sitting in this cold conference room and the meeting went on forever. And back in Stockholm, Sweden, it was time for my son to go to bed. I desperately wanted to be with him, and I know he missed me too. But I couldn't walk away and make a call or be with him to say goodnight. And he is just one of millions of children in the world missing their loved ones. Uh, think about children in hospitals, in refugee camps, and children with parents that don't live together anymore. Then it hit me, what if he had my heartbeat in his teddy bear so he could feel a sense of my closeness and feel more secure and loved before he went to sleep. Uh, a mother's heartbeat is actually the first child experience that provides them with 
connection and security. And it's scientifically proven that heartbeat reduces stress and also improves sleep. And in today's world, we are all, many of us are separated from each other many times. My company, Studio Heartbear, has developed a heartbeat communication platform uh, that provides you with the possibility to send your personal heartbeat into a connected object. And the goal is to bridge the distance between people that love and care for each other when they can't be together. Uh, my heart bear, here we have a little dummy, is our first application. It is a combination of a smartphone app and this teddy bear. So first you record your heartbeat and then via Bluetooth send it to the heart of the teddy bear where it's stored, you give it to someone you love, and they can, whenever they like, access a feeling of your closeness. Uh, so, invest in my heart bear, and I believe that together we can help these millions of children in the world fe to feel more secure and loved before they go to sleep. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. So if that doesn't get your heart, I don't know what will <laughs> in this pitch session. So I'm going to let um, this side of the room, is there anyone here that would like to ask a question? This side of the room? We haven't gone any this way. That in the back, please. Hmm. Hello. Yeah, Hello. I just would like to know, um, is it just possible to record it or also to do it live? live? Uh, it will be, yeah, you can do it live as well. So it, dep it, it depends how who you would like to have it, because a lot of parents, for instance, are, are afraid of their radio frequencies, etc. So that's why the mo we would like to introduce the more simple one where you actually have uh, the app and you Bluetooth, and it's stored in the teddy bear. But we have a prototype where you actually are sending, sending because that was my, my thought back in Caracas. I definitely wanted to send my heartbeat to my son. Wonderful. So can you tell me like a bit about the, 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 the product side, like, you know, y is there some kind of partner like of teddy bears and what Not kind of technology? This is, this is a true, it's a baby. It's just an alpha version, a working prototype. Uh, I've invested uh, my, <laughs> my own money into it. So uh, now I'm actually looking for someone to bring it to the market. Okay, it's one of the most uh, touching pictures I've ever mm. heard. Like a really good one. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, I must say that this is really, really cool. The idea is incredible. Um, and uh, it personally resonates with a lot of people, um, whether it's children or boyfriend, girlfriends, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It really does uh, touch many hearts, as, as, as my colleague here said. Mm -hmm. Um, just wanted to think about uh, sort of the application part a little bit more. Yeah. Have you, you know, um, I'm sure you've spoken to other people about this. You've personally invested your own capital. Mm -hmm. How has been the reception of others? Um, and wondering if, I mean, at least in the Middle East, I'm a Middle Easterner. Mm -hmm. That's, we're emotional people by nature. Yeah. Um, that's what <laughs> many people say. Um, so up in cold Scandinavia, is that similar kind of? Uh, I think you <laughs> maybe are more, more into it, but of course, to keep you warm, course. you gotta we do it. We are emotional <laughs> as well. Yeah, Clearly and you the came market. Out of Sweden. Yeah, and the market, and I mean, the market is enormous. Mm -hmm. Almost every child Charlotte, has a te teddy bear. Talk a little bit about um, defense and military. Like you've had conversations yeah. with veterans. Yeah. And for instance, for instance, if you see all 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 the people sure. from the U.S. 
going abroad, uh, there you could actually both, you could sell two because one with one leaving and, <laughs> and the one at home. Right. So I see it's more, it's, it's, this is a baby and the possibilities and the strategic choices are enormous. So I'm of course, I love to bring this darling to the market. And so I, n I need help from a partner and of course capital because mine is, I'm so bootstrapped. Okay, two, two things. Um, Heba, did you have a qu Heba, did you have a question? No, actually, I was just going to ask about sort of the, r the response from the market, but I guess you already covered this, and I, d yeah. I didn't understand, because it says here that you've started working on this in 2013, so yeah. I thought maybe that you had started selling them, but I guess you haven't, right? No, because uh, I ran out of, of, of uh, money, and I have to support myself, but I, know I believe in this uh, solution, so I keep going. I have to have ordinary jobs, etc. And to me, it is to meet the right investor partner that are as passionate as I am. Fida, and then we'll go to Heba. You wanted a question too? This Heba. Okay. Fida first, and then Heba, and then we're going to move on to the next one. Go on. Sorry. Pardon? Have you thought of how can you add to the product so maybe smell, maybe oh, yeah. uh, AI voice, it yeah. could answer some questions. Oh, oh yeah, I, I mean it's, but I concentrated actually on the heartbeat because there are teddy bears out, th connected teddy bears out there. This is, I, I mean, I would like it to be very emotional, but of course to add a scent of a loved one, maybe be able to put some heat, heat in it so you have a multi, really multi-sensory experience of it. And then of course, yeah, and you carry it around in this little beautiful backpack. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, it is an embryo to, you can do almost what you would like to do with it. But I think it's great to, to stay in the core, the original idea, and then expand. Because we have other uh, target groups like elderly people that are alone, etc. I also got approached by, we are thinking about having a heartbeat library on, uh, in the cloud, where you actually can save har heartbeats. That was such a, a touching story with a mother calling me because the father of her children was was dying, and she def desperately wanted. Uh, yeah. Charlotte, mm -hmm. one, one last question, and then we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. Don't cry. No. Heba, let's go. <laughs> and don't make us. Don't make us cry either, please. <laughs> um, in your hands right now, is that a work in prototype? No, unfortunately, that one I had to leave behind because. I made this uh, prototype two years ago, and Apple has been doing all this. It was a software issue, so and we didn't have the right Bluetooth versions because we are so bootstrapped. So, by <laughs> yeah, but it it will be working. So if you are interested, I'm happy to come back here or invite you guys to to Stockholm to experience it. It's fun, just go in the summertime. You don't yeah. have to deal with the snow. <laughs> okay, Charlotte, thank you mm. so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay, Gita is from neighbor, Dubai. She's local. Known her for almost 10 years now. Mina Microfinance, let's go. I know, another center, huh? Are you ready? Awesome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Anu, for this opportunity. Thank you, Nama. Hi, Huda, <laughs> whom I know as well for a long time. So basically, uh, we call it microfinance, but I found uh, since I started in this venture that microfinance is actually a very costly initiative in, uh, uh, in this region because you have to have a very large capital, which is obviously defeats the purpose. But let me just pass you through the slides. There are three main uh, microfinance in institutions in Bahrain, and uh, these three are barely known by the public. I knew them because I was looking into microfinance as an uh, institution perspective, 
but when I st questioned the ladies that were identified by volunteers who needed finance, none of the ladies that were questioned knew anything about these three entities, which is quite surprising. So what I realized was that these microfinance in institutions actually worked with women who came to them, but they were not going out and looking for women. So what I'm doing is actually going to women and seeking through cooperatives in Fujairah, Umm al Kuwain, and Bahrain, uh, women who are in need of funding. So the main challenges are sourcing money, the monthly cash flow, and the number of competitors. So all of them are doing more or less the same things. I will show you later, if you're interested, some of the items that are done. They're basically vintage material. So in Bahrain, it costs around uh, 5 million Bahraini dirhams. So obviously, it is uh, something which is not possible for a microfinance. So what I thought is, I turn it around. If we can't do microfinance, let's do the same thing, but we'll do micro trading. So instead of giving loans, which is regulated by the central banks, we actually buy the material and allow the women to have the material and give us once they have the money for, once they have sold the products. So basically, this is what it became. The scale of the project, small projects, they are all small purses or uh, jackets, vintage jackets. Uh, some are handbags, some are bags for the beaches, etc. So the money that they get from them are between 200 dirhams and 500 dirhams. So the idea was We mentored them, and instead of them competing against each other in these fairs, we actually give them a central distribution possibility. So we buy from them all the products, we mandate them to do a certain number of products, and only that number of products. So, for example, if they're doing Abaya and Shaila, and this is a product which is actually in collaboration with Rajasthani women uh, who are in microfinance projects themselves, so basically, the end of the shayla or the end of the abaya will be with that Rajasthani product. So it's a solidarity kind of uh, um, um, initiative. So the women in the UAE and in Bahrain will buy from women from microfinance initiatives in Rajasthan, and they will use that for their own material. So basically, they're investing in women, and we invest in the women in the UAE and Bahrain. They are coached by volunteers mostly, so that is to keep them uh, co the the management costs of the microfinance initiative to the lowest possible. Okay. Are you almost done, Tita? Almost, yeah. Okay, you have 30 seconds. So these are the products. We have the lower value, we have the middle va value, and we are also working with designers like uh, in Laurent Dublanchy, who provides us with the uh, tailoring and as well as the design for uh, this product for abayas, high-level abayas. The website. So up to now, we have 50 volunteers, and we have uh, 20 women in Rajasthan whom we've helped, and 13 women who are on the standby in UAE. We can't help them because apparently you have to have a, a company, otherwise you're not allowed to do it. Yeah. So I'm waiting for funding for se setting up a company that can do micro-trading. Fantastic. Who'd like to start first? Questions? Sorry, I just wanted to clarify a point. You yes. said that you basically allow them to buy the fabrics from you and then pay you when the fabrics are sold, or yes. do you buy the items from them and then I sell I buy it the themselves? items from right. them, and the distribution channels mm -hmm. are like, for example, Carrefour, Lulu oh, okay. Hypermarket. As part of their CSR, they're willing to give us the distribution channel for free. Oh, I see. So then you make back the money uh, that way? Yes, oh, yes. Okay. So we buy uh, from the Rajasthani women from 20 to 120 dirhams, mm. and the product is sold at 250 to 300. And for the higher level products, they're sold at uh, 800 dirhams yeah. for an abaya with the border, which is yeah. nicely decorated. Cool. So you've already been doing this already, and you have Lulu We've done and a Carrefour. test case, but then I found out through lawyers that it's not allowed to do it without a company. So obviously, then we have to do a, uh, we have to set up a company, and the costs are different. You wouldn't be able to set up one company and have them all under you, like a yes, DED that's license? Yes, that's, oh. that's the intent. 
Next question, Toda. Actually, just want to say thank you, um, Gita. You're a very smart business person and a banker. <laughs> and a, so my question is: Is this is this initiative for you an impact investment, just to do good, and or make money or good money? I mean, what's the business model? The business There's model not a lot of is information. obviously it is to make money, and uh, the ultimate reality of it is I want to set up a microfinance fund, which will be managed using these first cases which then are scaled up into the microfinance fund Great initiative. Thank any you. more any more questions Haba? Um, the lawyers sorry the lawyers that advise you to set up the company uh, yes where did they advise you to set it up what's the estimated cost because that's something that you need support with right yes um, I actually already uh, have those cost uh, costings for a company and it costs between 500,000 and 1 million dollar because the idea is we have to have our own warehouse to put the material and the Rajasthani women that we're helping we actually have to have a place for them to work in together because if they work each of them alone they cannot then bring it back uh, the distribution channels are very complicated fantastic thank you um, is Helen here? I, her mother had to go to the hospital. Is Helen here? Yes, you made it. Awesome. Is your mother okay? Yes. Is your mother? So, so this woman came from prayers. Jordan. <laughs> this, this has been quite quite a day for you. Yeah. Thank so you for coming. Th thank you. Thank, thank you for having you. me. Um, so I decided to switch it up a little bit after hearing all the heartwarming stories. And I'm not going to actually take you through the slides since you have them available, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? So uh, Picasso once said that all children are born artists, and I'd like to say that all children are born entrepreneurs. And to put it in context, today we have unemployment rates of over 20%, 25% if you add uh, North Africa, and there's actually 70% of the unemployed are actually university graduates, they have high school degrees, but they're not finding the right jobs. Putting that into the situation today where most, we, we have the highest youth in the entire world in the MENA region. I decided I wasn't going to wait for education to change because truly education isn't preparing children for the world that they're going to be living in tomorrow. And if we're going to prepare our children for a world where nine to five jobs are going to be scarce, where automation and artificial intelligence are going to be taking over, then we need to focus a little bit of on a different angle, on a different side. So I founded a company called Future Entrepreneurs, and we brought in multiple uh, curriculums, one of which is BizWorld, which is based out of Silicon Valley. And what we've decided to do is to actually integrate into entrepreneurship education within the curriculums. We've been able to secure a pilot program with the Ministry of Education in Dubai. We're now in talks with the Ministry of Education in Jordan as well, and we're launching in Egypt next week. And we do multiple different uh, programs. What we are able to do is integration into IB schools, but as well as uh, public schools. Uh, we've also run our program in refugee camps, as well as um, uh, private schools, like I said, IB schools. So what does this say? It says that most children already have all the entrepreneurial skills that they need. All we have to do is actually ignite the skills needed, such as creativity, resilience, teamwork, leadership, the skills that no automation can actually take away from them. Um, my name is Helen Razezi. I'm a lawyer by education. I've been mentoring and working with entrepreneurs over the past 15 years. And what I've seen across the board is that all of them suffer from the same issues. They are not mentally and emotionally prepared for what is going to uh, come their way. Um, skills. I mean, Google's there for education, for, uh, for information. What we're here for as education is to give students skills and give the children skills. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who would like to go first with this, with this amazing entrepreneur? Questions? Ellen? All right. Yeah. Your, your name means a shining light, and yeah. you are a shining light. Thank you. So thank you Aww. for this wonderful no. presentation. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your forward-thinking approach to, towards education and awareness in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, this is something that um, for years I've been looking at because in the U.S. you have this, you know, right from, you know, middle school and high school, people are getting that awareness, yeah. whereas here, being a government um, um, 
employee is like the highest accolade that one can can aim to achieve yeah. you know right from from high school that's what you're that's what's drilled into people so just back to your business model which seems to be a question that all um, judges kind of have in their minds yeah. um, wh how are you how are you sort of you know wh how are you structuring it so um, like I said we have multiple revenue streams one of them and the the main bread and butter is actually working with governments mm -hmm. and so our pilot program uh, with the Ministry of Education is it's an annual fee that we train the teachers and then we sell books to the kids so that's primarily our bread and butter mm -hmm. the second side is we do a lot of after-school workshops so we've been um, asked by organizations like gems uh, the group to actually go in and do after-school activities and they have over 70 schools just in the UAE we're uh, partnering with organizations in places like Egypt and there's 82 schools that we've already got access to in Egypt mm -hmm. um, I'd actually margin like to differentials are huge though between yeah. the UAE and Egypt Absolutely. I'm Egyptian so I know and <laughs> the thing is and the thing is we've worked in refugee camps right. but we've also worked in IB schools mm -hmm. and so I know for a fact that it works mm -hmm. and um, the other thing that we would love to be able to integrate is an online um, uh, online platform because what's happened with our alumni is that they all want to be able to connect um, after they've, uh, they've gone through the program. And that's one of the things that we would like to also be able to incorporate. <coughs> Any more questions? Yes. I have a comment. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so it's not really a question. I was recently talking to this entrepreneur based out of Cairo that has a platform called Nafham, okay. which, does, which is l similar to like a Khan Academy style. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that they get about 3 million visitors, I think, a week or something of students trying to learn online. Yeah. So perhaps that could be a really good model for you to look at or okay. to integrate with because they're sufficiently making sufficient money just through yeah. ads. So, yeah. I mean, that's exactly why. I mean, I've looked into uh, being able to do that. It's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars investment if you're going to do it correctly, uh, yeah. because you need to be able to track the information and yeah. what they're actually uh, learning and to actually have KPIs and to have uh, outcomes at the end of it. So it's, it's a hefty investment, but that's part of the plan. And I mean, if you're going to ask me what my dream is, in five years, I want to have schools. I want to have schools. I want to have academies. I've already got the name. I've got the whole <laughs> thing covered. This is what I think the future is. Yeah. You don't think that would be, sorry, you don't think it would be really interesting to have people record their own content and share it with students like entrepreneurs or people yeah. from Silicon Valley or whatever, like in a way that is a bit more scalable? Absolutely. And one, one of the things that we're doing is we've just launched a, uh, an entrepreneur challenge for kids and we have partners such as Entrepreneur Magazine, etc. And we're doing a Shark Tank style event and we're going to have a lot of the entrepreneurs mentor the kids. And we also have had people make videos, uh, but they're the kids making videos and they're the, they want to share it with their friends and their peers. And I mean, th th the opportunity is endless. The kids are sponges. And I'm going to say a little story, if you'd allow me. I was in no, a refugee camp. Left, by the way, Perfect. I okay, was in good. a refugee camp this summer. And uh, one of the children um, at the end of the program went to his father and said, the reason why you're not making enough money is because you're not calculating the cost of X, Y, Z, which was the petrol that he was using in his car. And the kids are sponges, and they know what entrepreneurship is. We didn't have to do much. But we're not al allowing them, and we're not giving them this platform to to experiment, to explore. And when you talk about failure and the fear of failure, which I've, I mean, we have 51% fear, fear of failure in the UAE, which is the most progressive part of the Middle East. So we're here to kind of change that uh, narrative, change that story, and try to make a difference in the MENA region. And we're a big believer in starting younger. So thank, thank you, you so much thank for you. your thank you. today. And thank you for coming all the way from Jordan. Um, next in line is Khadija Bezad. Khadija. And I believe you're right from UAE as well, correct? Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Khadija Bahzad, no. uh, founder of Beep Mobile Application. Just a brief introduction about Where myself. I studied international business, and I have 10 years experience in the industry in different fields, finance, events, uh, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Let me start my pitch by, uh, by sharing a statistic with you. Did you know that 88% of handed business cards 
goes to trash in less than a week. So 88% of you, what you are spending or what your company is spending on business cards are going to trash. So what are the problems we are facing? As an individual, how many of you have your business, all the collected business cards organized? Okay, even if you have organized, uh, do you know which cards are outdated? Okay, so many, many of us, we don't have the time to search or organize our received business cards. When we, go, when we go to events, we keep forgetting or run, uh, running out of business cards. And it's very, by using paper business cards, you never know if which cards are outdated. And it's the same for companies. Many companies still today are using manual steps to issue business cards for their employees. They are spending a lot of time and money. At the end, 88% of, uh, of the efforts are being wasted. So my solution is, uh, a mobile application for virtual business cards. The, th uh, the solution allows companies to issue virtual cards for their employees instantly and hassle-free. Then employees can exchange their cards with others by using their smartphones. So uh, by using our solution, companies can issue instant business cards and save resources. And individuals can have all, your, uh, all their business cards organized, accessible, and up-to-date. So what uh, value we are adding is uh, increasing savings, uh, increasing efficiency, and protecting the, uh, the environment. So the, uh, this is screenshots of the application. The main page, here the sign-up page. For example, you can add more than one card, for example, if you are working and you are an entrepreneur at the same time, so you can add two cards and share which card you want with the person you're meeting. This is an example of a card, infor uh, card with the information in it. You have the contacts page. And you can also share your con uh, your co uh, the cards which you have with your network. And you can edit your profile, like the notification, if you would like to receive notifications, or if you want to be visible in a search, or you want to be invisible. Some highlights. Our subscriptions plan suits uh, different company size, as our main revenue model is a subscription for companies. Whether if you are an entrepreneur or we have a big organization, we have a package which is suitable for them. The contacts are accessi accessible offline, so even if you, are, if you don't have data package, still you can search for the business cards which you have. Contacts can still be exchanged with the other person who's not using the application. And uh, currently the application is in the final stages of development. Beepit.co is coming soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent, right on time. An Anvita. So I agree that like uh, this has been one of the most redundant things we do, but it's a lot to do with user behavior. But I still want to understand more about the product, right? You know, I'm using Beep, but what's on the other side? Like, how? You, what is the distribution network? Uh, if the other person is not using the application, still you can send it by email. For example, if he handed like uh, a paper business card, you can scan it. There will be a scanner in the in the application, and that person will automatically receive an email with your uh, information. Or it can be sent by Bluetooth as an image, or you can send it by uh, uh, the so uh, social media, like WhatsApp. But that's the challenge, right? It's a cash yeah. to situation. If I meet you, I absolutely don't know anything about you. Neither email, neither LinkedIn, neither social media. Yes. That's why I give you the card, right? If I have to send this information to that channel, then why would I not add you directly on LinkedIn? Sorry, can you repeat again? Um, so you are sending the information, right, uh, through these channels, right? So I don't really know mm -hmm. what your email is yeah. or, or your LinkedIn is, right? If I know your LinkedIn, then why would I send the information? Can I not add you directly? I want to really understand how you will there position will your product. For example, if the second person who I'm meeting is already in the application, there is a search option where I can search people by, uh, by uh, their names or the company name or like the mobile number. So any, anything which, uh, even like the family name, 
uh, because it's cloud-based. I think I might supplement that. I, yeah. I, I, I know what you're trying to say. And I think, I think what we're trying to say is, who are your competitors? So why would somebody use Beep as opposed to using LinkedIn? Exactly. Like, yeah, like if I, if I meet you, why don't I just add you on LinkedIn? Why would I use Beep? Because in LinkedIn, you will find like uh, a lot of information. This is like a smaller version where you can find the contact information specifically, not like the education background. There is uh, like um, an icon where you can get into their uh, LinkedIn but the card will include like their contact information, like their mobile number, their... Uh, which is uh, not always on LinkedIn, which is yeah, fair. It's which, not. which is fair. Yeah. Um, so, so my second question is, um, I, I like that, because uh, I'm the kind of person who has uh, one million mm -hmm. business cards which I never look at. Um, what, I saw this thing called subscription just now. How do you monetize? So, 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 so how, do you, how are you gonna yeah, monetize this? Yeah, so uh, um, companies, depending on the number of uh, business cards they want or depending on uh, their size or the number of employees, they, we have different packages so they can select the package which uh, like suits their size. So when they will subscribe, they like the HR department or the admin department will have like a dashboard. From that dashboard, they can even get like uh, statistics about uh, their employees, like how many cards exchanged uh, are done. And even if, for example, especially for the real estate sector, uh, they have salespeople, they make connections, but a lot of time like uh, salespeople like uh, move from one job to another. So by using our application, they can pull out all the connections they made during their uh, career in the, in the company. So they can pull it out and uh, um, give it to the new uh, person who's taking that position. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. You have one more question? Okay. Do you have features where they can, uh, for example, take notes? Uh, so yes. For example, this person is. A da -da -da yeah. For example, if I exchange my business card with you, I can write. For example, I met you in this event, so I will remember like uh, where did I meet this person. Thank and this you is so searchable. Much. Searchable. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're gonna move on to Layla. Are you here, Layla? Over there. Thank you. Dodd World. Correct. Did I say it right? Okay. Media. Media company. Hello, is it working? Yep. My name is Ina Ashur and I'm the founder of Dodd World. As parents, we always feel the importance of answering our children's questions and engaging their curious minds. However, personally, I've never been able to find a reliable video content for them in Arabic, our very own language that defines our culture. This sad fact inspired our startup, Dodd World a digital learning platform to help the most neglected six to 10 age group market by providing them with a unique video content in high quality Arabic language. The available online content in Arabic is only 5%, despite the fact that there are more than 176 Arabic speaker uh, users online. Uh, video content among children is very popular. This is why our videos are in 3D empowering children and communicating with them through our highly digitally savvy characters and their tech partners. Our serviceable addressable market is 7.8 million, which represents the number of married women in MENA who have a smart device and internet access. Uh, that word will offer high quality original Arabic content. Um, yeah, just be Okay, okay. Uh, that word is introducing a unique, okay. That world is introducing a unique proposition in the market by being the only company in MENA that provides diverse content among, among seven categories. And this specifically is our competitive advantage. Hi. Our, uh, our, we're currently developing our digital uh, product, which will be user friendly and will have user engagement features by creating an interactive uh, community where kids can relate to one another through their favorite topic or video, and by creating a user navigation experience. Uh, on our platform through our seven different categories and four subscription options. We will have, uh, we'll generate revenues through several uh, lines of business. Our uh, B2C lines of business include four subscription options, branded merchandise. Uh, our B2B lines of business include advertising package plans, corporate sponsorship opportunities for our content, edutainment shows as part of our community development and uh, business development and community awareness efforts, and uh, revenue sharing uh, generated by providing privileged uh, partnerships uh, with telecom and media companies. 
we have the potential to um, to uh, capitalize on the way uh, organizations are looking at uh, d digital Arabic content, which was which is why we are uh, pursuing partnerships with stakeholders from the government, media, telecom, events, education, and community development uh, organizations, all who aim to promote and preserve the Arabic language, particularly in education and in e-learning. Um, we can reach more audiences through uh, digital uh, campaigns by working closely with social media influencers, uh, partner with sponsors who won't mind posting our uh, content on, on their social media platforms to, to drive uh, purchase decisions. Um, we can also give incentives to users where they can invite their friends, uh, partner with, um, with telecom operators to reach mass audiences and all other uh, business development uh, efforts that we can do that can help our business do more with less. To analyze the demand, we created seven prototype videos and published them on YouTube several months ago. We already have more than 40,000 viewers and received positive feedback from parents, educators, and children. This was enough to team up with a co-founder and a tech partner. We are currently developing our new app, website, and 142 videos, so we are ready to launch by Add August yourself. 2018. Add yourself. We aim Add yourself. to have uh, 228 thousand subscribers with a net profit of 7.7 .7 million by the end of 2019 to to, to reach that goal we to that goal we need uh, funding through grants of 1.5 million AAD we already secured 150k out from this amount thank you we missed a zero here did you add no. you did you add hers I can't connect with you excellent who's gonna start Anvita. Uh, do you guys know about Lamsa? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they oh. have a different age group. Um, they have the interesting content as well, but they ser serve a uh, younger age group. So uh, uh, when you're serving like six to 10 years, have you thought about like uh, the business model collaborating, uh, collaborating with the schools? Yes. It's and part going through that via channel. Yes, yes, it's part of our uh, B uh, B2B uh, revenue stream. I'm going to add you to the group. We're, we're developing a different package uh, options just specifically for schools, so different combinations of videos based on their curriculum. Okay, and for the B2C model, how would you go about um, targeting mothers? It's, uh, it's a trial and error in the beginning. It's, uh, yeah, we're, um, it's work, we have seven categories. We have health, tech, math, uh, poetry, music. So we'll mix and match and see which packages are really um, profiting, and then we will, yeah, we'll do it. Um, this is your question, right? Like no, which no, what package I meant like, are you know, how are you going to scale up? How are you going to make yourself discover or to the mothers, right? That's your ah, target okay. customer segment. Yeah, it's, uh, it was uh, in the user acquisition strategies where we're working closely, like you said, with schools. We'll do uh, digital campaigns. We'll give uh, like a popular channel, a children channel, uh, TV uh, channels, uh, like free fillers between episodes, um, digital PR, digital marketing, uh, Working closely with sponsors, uh, that, that particularly, because they have, they have uh, mass audiences on their me social media platforms, and we've already talked to a lot of them, and they're willing to post our short videos, our teaser videos on their platforms to drive uh, a traffic to our platforms. Frida, you had a question? One more. Can we get a mic, please, to this lady? Sada, thank you. So more about competition. If it's not LAMSA, then who is your uh, regional competitor? And uh, the other part of the question is, is there a uh, global company that's doing that, that you can benchmark against or learn from? Uh, yes, there's a company. There's an app uh, called BrainPop. Uh, it's, it's well known in the US, and they have it in different languages as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's a reference. Basically, their app is a reference for any topic that you want. We have a similar categories like they have. And, uh, but the idea is that we wanted to create something that's more interesting and more exciting for children based on their categories because it is a successful app. Uh, and they use it basically in many schools, even in this region, but they don't have the Arabic version of it and they don't have Ar Arabic content. Yeah. You have another question or Regional no? Regional uh, uh, No, actually to cover this age group with the diverse content that we will offer, no. no. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any more questions for our entrepreneurs? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next company is uh, 
Palestinian woman founder and an American. Where are you, Tally? She's back over there. Okay, great. So Moss is going to present, and then uh, Tally will join in the Q&A. Okay. Dausat, let's go. Three more companies. companies. Um, they asked me to uh, speak in English. I will speak in English, but first of all, please smile, since I'm speaking uh, about Dausat, to be more healthier, and I will begin. I am Mas Watad. I am a Palestinian. Um, I, uh, uh, I will speak about Dausat company. Uh, Dausat is the solution for the Arab world, for the region, to lose weight uh, by eating everything delicious, uh, in, in our uh, home kitchen, like Maklubi, Knafi, Ma'amul, and uh, collect dawsat and lose weight. Did you bring any samples? <laughs> 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 yeah, we have, uh, we have helped thousands of people to lose weight uh, in Palestine, Jordan. Um, these people lose more than 40 kilo, 50 kilo, uh, our average is to lose weight for four, five kilo in the month. Impressive. By using this, I invent the Dausat method bit, uh, before uh, 15 ye uh, years. Dausat is a formula which combines between <coughs> uh, fat, calories, and protein. Um, Dausat is instead of calories. Dausat is a combine of calories uh, and fat and protein. Using this, every food has its value, and every activity has its value. Like if you like to eat mamul, you can eat mamul, three mamuls, um, equal to whole this meal. Dawale, kusa, and tabuli, equal to three mamuls. You can eat falafel and compare between, uh, you can cleaning the house uh, three hours or dancing in the wedding for hours, for example. Now we know that we have a big problem in the region. Um, six out of the fattest countries in the world are in the Middle East. So we, we have a problem and we are the solution. Because if you, if you eat forbidden, no knafe, no chocolate, after that, you will return to our Arab kitchen, you eat knafe, chocolate, and continue your life. So <laughs> we make you more healthier. By using this, we have we're using the technology for this solution. We have online groups. If you are in your home, you can uh, join uh, our online groups. You can join our offline groups if you are uh, in, in communities like um, um, every, every, um, every place you can uh, be in offline groups and online groups. We have a very uh, successful uh, Android and iOS application, uh, which more than uh, 100,000 people success with us using this application. We have a very successful social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, our website, Dausat. All, all of them are in Arabic, and we um, use uh, just Arabic uh, to uh, uh, give people the right information about nutrition and eating more healthier. Uh, we have uh, in person and online groups, and uh, we have a very uh, successful magazine, Dausat, which is very, uh, have all the articles in Arabic. Um, we believe in women combined with girl power. We find the strong women leaders in their region, um, and we um, give him all the information and guide him to be leader in their communities. Thank you. Are you almost done? Yeah, I'm Close. done. Uh, in all the communities, and we, uh, they uh, wellness entrepreneur, after that, they open their uh, own groups. Questions? Great, thank you. Hi. Ah, Laniba. Thank you so much. This was so nice to hear from you. Um, 
So I just want to know from what do you think is the differentiator between you because there's so many apps and programs and ways to lose weight online and through Facebook and WhatsApp and this and that. Yeah. So I was speaking think? Arabic, she was speaking yeah. English. Okay. Oh, okay. لا منافس لا دوسات في العالم العربي ما في عنا منافس لأنه دوسات هي وحدة قياس للأكل العربي يعني لما باجي بقول لك مثلا بتحبي كعكة اللي هي تقريبا 100 سعر حراري غلط أظلني أقول إنه هاي الكعكة زي هاي التفاحة الكبيرة اللي فيها 100 سعر حراري فلما نخترع الدوسات بكل فخر الدوسات بتشمل السعرات الحرارية البروتينات والنشويات في نفس المنتج نفسه فالكعكة بتوصل من دوستين لثلاث لأربعة حسب قديش فيها دهون والحبة التفاح بتظلها نص دوسة كحبة تفاح كيف إحنا متعودين عليها حسب الدراسة اللي عملناها لحد اليوم ما في إلنا منافس في العالم العربي بس في إلنا منافس شركة الويت ووترز العالمية اللي فيها البوينتس يمكن تكون منافس رغم إنه الفحوى اللي عنا معتمد كله على أبحاث علمية وعلى أخصائيات تغذية وعلى أطباء اللي دايما بعطونا وعلى طبعا مصادر علمية اللي إحنا نوصل المعلومة الصح بلغة الناس اللي بحبوها فما بصير إنه ننشر يلا نشرنا بحث عالمي بس هل هذا البحث وصل للناس كيف لازم فإحنا موجودين بنأهل نساء قياديات للعمل نعطي فرص عمل للنساء وين هم موجودات النساء هدول بندربهم أونلاين وهدول النساء بصيروا هم يشتغلوا من بيوتهم خاصة هون بالشارقة أو بدبي من بيوتهم في جمعيات نسائية في مدارس في أماكن العمل في كل محل يعملوا مجموعات حلقات داعمة نسائية لا هاي الحلقات بتغير نمط الحياة لأكثر صحة مع النساء نفسها Thank you Thank you Kelly, you want to respond to this? Um, I'm happy to add also on the differentiators. I think that on a global level, if you look at the Weight Watchers or the Slimming Worlds of the World, and we have quite a good relationship with them, and we understand why they're not here in the region, um, we're a differentiator because they understand they only know how to speak to the mainstream Caucasian audience. They don't know how to speak to specific cultures where people, you can't just add a taco or falafel into a food index to help people learn to live healthier within their own cultures. We're saying, no, your culture is part of who you are. And so you're not going to put aside your kitchen in order to live healthier. And in fact, both your culture and the most cutting edge nutrition can actually live together in one. With respect to the local market, we're differentiated in that we have a proven method that has helped thousands of people lose weight. And we provide a 360 solution of where you are, whether it's your mobile app, online groups at home, or actually showing up in person for an in-person group. Great. Cool. Hold on. Question? So are you si no um, to follow up? So are you saying there's nothing similar that talks about Arabic food? We are sure. Okay, uh, okay. interesting. Fida, hello. Uh, can we get her a mic, please? Can we get her a mic, please? Thank you. ما وصلت إلى المرحلة اللي تحكي على البزنس موديل فيها. So maybe if you can just take a minute to walk us. Yeah, the last slide was up describing the business model, and we thought we would stick up there. But basically, our business model is very simple. It's a monthly subscription. People pay us to come to our in-person groups on a monthly basis. Sometimes three months, six months, nine months. People pay to come to our online groups. Where are you now, Kelly? Where where we have we have revenue that are will be at about a quarter million in revenue. This year, dollars. This year, we've just launched the beginning of 2017. Location-wise, where are you? We have just opening in Bahrain, Amman, uh, and Palestine, and we have in London as well. Okay. okay. We are accepted into an accelerator in Bahrain in the CH9 um, hub there. Yeah. أنا بدي أعطي مثال لبرنامج كيف ممكن نأكل وننحف مع دوسات. بنصبح الصبح مع كاسة شاي أخضر. ممكن نأخذ حبة تمر. ممكن نأخذ نص منقوشة إذا ما بدنا تمر. طبعاً المنقوشة 12 دوسة. نص منقوشة ستة. بعد ساعتين ممكن نوكن سندويش صغير كمان من خبز ممكن يكون طبعا أسمر لأنه إحنا حاليا بنحاول قد ما نقدر شو إحنا بنحب نوكل في البيت بس بنعمل صحي أكثر بعدها وجبة الغداء شو طبخين إن أول أبليكيشن في عنا كل وجبة موجود فيها قدش فيها دوسات زي موسوعة كاملة عملنا بعد العصر ممكن نوكل أي إشي ممكن نوكل كنافة ست دوسات وبالليل بما إنه أكلنا كنافة نوكل إشي خفيف كاسة أعشاب ممكن نأخذ سلطة، ممكن نأخذ لبن رائب. طبعاً في عنا برامج في اليوتيوب طبخات مطبخ ماس بالدوسات 
فيديوهات طبخ اللي عملناها كيف نعمل مطبخنا اكثر صحي بس اذا طبخنا الملوخيه باي طريقه طبخناها احنا بنحسب لها دوسات حسب كيف انتم بتحبوا تاكلوها بس اكيد النصائح بتاخذوها بالتالي with respect to the business model just continue what if, yeah. what if something like uh, my fitness pal airbizes or added add some uh, arabic food to their huge library of ingredients and then arabizes the application would this would this be a threat no it, it, it would be great because it would get people thinking more about health and wellness we want people around the region to be thinking about health and wellness and that they can do so within their kitchen that's why right now our app our mobile app is free has over 100,000 downloads it is free we are going to roll out a paid version that is uh, going to be at the end of Q1 2018 anything that raises people all of our content we have over 300 blog posts and videos and recipes for healthy living. We want people to break with their current mindset and understand that they can live healthier within their own culture. It's great. Now, we add much more than what a MyFitnessPal can do because we have a more holistic view and because it's layered on top of what we know is the online groups pr uh, platform as well as our in-person group platform. And what's, what Mas got to touch on at the very end is the model in which we grow in the region with respect to our offline groups, which is the Dausat Wellness Entrepreneurs. We are reaching women around the region. We recruit them online, we train them online, and then we give them the support to run healthy wellness businesses using our methodology in their communities. So that's something that my fitness pal is, is great. It's not that, it's something else. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next entrepreneur is another media company. This is Mashal from Iraq, correct? Iraq, no? From here, you're from here, UAE. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, great. Uh, before I start off, I just wanna ask a question. How many of you are familiar with BuzzFeed? Raise your hand. BuzzFeed. And how many of you use Facebook? Or Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram? Right. Now, I grew up watching media and I was unable to relate. And there are millions of women around the world who have grown up knowing that their voice is missing that we're just not hearing about. And that's why we're here. We're a media company by women for women. So my co-founder is based in DC, I'm based here. We actually have a remotely based volunteer driven team of 58 people from around the world. And the reason why we also strongly believe in the mission is because we were unable to find diversity. Every time we look at media, we see token representations. People want us to write and fit within a mold. But regardless of what your background is, what your age is, where you come from, you should be writing and we're giving you a platform to write. So over the past year, what we've done is we're di disrupting the media. And again, going back to most media companies, even if they're for women, they're being run by men. You know, and there's too many people that are speaking for us instead of letting us speak. So what are we doing differently? Over the past year, we spent a year figuring out how to have personal storytelling and authentic narratives. And we've built an audience with over 3 million monthly readers. Um, we're going at a rate of 250,000 readers increasing every month. And even though we started off in DC, we have a very large audience in the Middle East as well as Southeast Asian countries. So we decided because there's no company here that's focusing on diversity and millennials the way we are in the terms of you know, personal storytelling, um, we recently have opened up an office here and we're empowering local writers to bring forward their stories. Um, this is just to give you an example. We have more than 1,200 contributors from around the world. Um, over 25 countries, and again, we're growing at a rate of 40% month by month. The reason I speak about BuzzFeed is it's a company that's worth $1.5 billion today. Um, at our stage, they were growing at 12 readers per dollar spent, and we're growing at 250 readers per dollar spent. Um, though that's our traction right now. We hit 3 million monthly readers right now, and this is all at a completely bootstrapped budget. Um, another thing is the diversity city perspective, so instead of, like I said, in the North American market, when it comes to regardless of whether you're Middle Eastern, whether you're African American, like regardless of your background, again, we're letting them write, and we have eight different channels from weddings to life, love, health, social justice, um, news, and then now and beyond, which is focusing on career advice and the STEM fields. 
Um, another thing that we're doing differently is there's 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world and nobody is creating content that's accessible to them. So I'm personally spearheading the pivot to accessibility where we're creating all content in articles, videos, and in audio, and it's completely accessible to people with disabilities because accessibility is a human right and we want to lead that pivot because we're at a position too. Thank you. Um, Again, the potential is crazy. BuzzFeed has been able to raise millions of dollars. Uh, right now, like I said, they're worth $1.5 billion. We want to work with brands and companies because we've built a very loyal audience and we want to raise brand awareness and brand trust. But instead of banner ads and traditional storytelling, we want to write it our way. So again, we fit right in the middle um, where we're accessible, millennial focused, intellectual you know, content, but ultimately, um, our demographics are changing, so it's not just millennial women, we're seeing older demographics read our content, and so we want to encompass from being just millennial focused to having included being everybody. And another thing that we're doing is including Gen Zs, because I'm a millennial, I'm actually 22 years old, but I am so familiar with social media, but people younger than me are just it's second nature to them. So we're letting them run our social media, so regardless of what your age, background, whatever it is, you can write for us, and you know, we're here to change the media landscape. Wow, right on time. Thank you, awesome. All right, who wants to start this conversation? Are we going that way or this way? Anybody on this side? No? Hi, Hi, Hi how are you? Um, so how are you sourcing content and writers? Like, What's your method to getting as many as possible and making sure that the quality is good and making sure it's scalable right. and really like, to differentiate because I still don't really see the differentiation point because you said for example like something like Mick is a bit more focused on millennials but I feel like their content goes across the board and it's written by Gen Z's and right. I mean it's really like very open to everyone and it's super accessible and it's so it's, inter it's interesting you and um, you mentioned Mike because my co-founder used to work in Mike and they said okay you wear hijab you're a Muslim this is the perspective we want you to write uh, she also worked for Huffington Post and different writers. Actually, we, this year we were awarded 30 under 30 for media by Forbes. We got that award. The reason is because we don't want you to fit within a mold, right? So what we're doing is personal storytelling, and the best way to do that is to hand the mic to everyday women. We have a community team that reaches out to different writers, writers that are just starting off, or even if they haven't written before, we're here to work with them and mentor them on how to write better and to write very personal storytelling. So a lot of topics are considered taboo. Um, I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia. Um, I did not see representation, but we have a very big audience. So 40% of our audience is in UAE and in Saudi Arabia. This is all English content. Our plan for next year is to have Arabic content in the same way millennial focus and what differentiates us is that it's personal. Um, if you read any of the stories, the reason why women are sharing it from different parts of the world is because it's very personal and it's very authentic. Um, and that's what we're looking for. You know, instead of having big name writers, have younger women write. Let them speak and share their stories because everyone has a story to tell and as long as they want to write, you know, we're here for them. So I was looking at your benchmark and we're actually a millennial and Gen Z focused media company and we do have podcasts and we are audio video and all these other platforms. How do you compete with, say, a mogul, a Muslim girl? Um, there are these platforms that are also catered to that same audience. They mm -hmm. are looking at Arabs and whatnot, and they're pan, they're global right, as well. Right. Yeah. So we spent a year figuring out what works best when it comes to each region. So we've nailed down which region and what content is going to perform better in which region, which country. Um, and that's why we're going to segregate the Middle East one. The, we're establishing here as a Tempest Arabia. and. Um, Every content is specific. So one thing that, again, even Muslim girl and, you know, they limit the writers. And again, there's a lot of um, there's no actual diversity because with a lot of companies, even when it comes to diversity, um, there's somewhere or the other that they're eliminating the readers or the writers because they want it to be within specifics. But with us, it's, you know, whatever your topic is, whatever you want to talk about, you can do it. Um, and coming from a tech background, I was one of two girls who graduated from security. Um, I've been able to write about, you know, seeing all male panels, the boys club, all those articles, and other women share personal experiences that are similar. So um, even the pitches that women are comfortable, uh, we're at a stage where even though we're actively reaching out to local writers in every single region where we have an audience, people are still pitching us without us reaching out to them. Um, and there are very, very personal stories about topics that sometimes would be considered taboo or you would, wouldn't see in the mainstream. So you're looking at more of like a medium model? So yeah, medium. so our sponsored content model is similar to BuzzFeed in the sense that we create articles and videos. Um, 
and it's native advertising. So it's similar to our own content, but except it's more personal, and that's what people engage with. Okay, who else has a question? Fidel. Competitor is mm -hmm. like a company called Stepfeed, mm -hmm. I think, that's based out of Lebanon. Yep, yep. How are you different? So their content is more generic in the sense that they're not focused on women in particular. Um, and again, one thing that differentiates us is so all our writers are women, right? Um, if you're a staffer, you could be a man, but um, 58 women all remotely based, a lot of them here, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, right? They're all women. And because we know what we're writing about, we're more specific in the sense that like our content is different. It's not as generic. It's more personal and any piece is not gonna be generic in that essence. Awesome, thank right. you. Is there, is there another back here? One more. Finally on this side, <laughs> thank you. Hi, firstly, um, I'm super impressed by your pitch. I'm really glad you're doing it. One question I have is, in relation to the Me Too hashtags that went around and the expose um, in America, that was really, really amazing, all the publications that published all their stories, but a reason that can't happen in the UK is the libel laws. Um, the libel laws um, constricting media publications from doing that. If you have um, pub publications, if you're um, publishing across in various different countries, you said over 50 countries, how are you going to constrain, are you not setting any rules? You said you're publishing No, so we're segregating off, we're segregating off based on region. Um, we've had minimal funding so far, um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna segment off regions so that, because there are certain topics that aren't okay here, but that are very, that women really wanna read in the North American market. So based on that, we're segmenting off. So it's, it would be like middleeast.thetempest.co um, or for example, uk.thetempest.co. Um, I think, is that it? I have a question for you. Ah. If you got an offer to be bought out tomorrow, would you entertain it? Bought out in the sense that people want to invest or? No, completely bought out. No. Thank you. That's the answer I was looking for, but thank you. <laughs> There is one more, um, no, two more entrepreneurs that we have to go uh, today. We've got um, Jara, and our next, our, our next pitch is from Soraya, Soraya Faludi, and she came from New York City, so thank you, Soraya, for coming. Um, please stay until the end. We've got one more after this, and we'll take photos and things like that. I, I'd love for all of you to, to stick around, and we get some photos, if that's possible. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Saraya Fuladi, and I am the founder and CEO of Jara, a company scaling quality education to disaster affected regions and refugee camps and the world through our technology. Please meet Sanjana. I met Sanjana two weeks ago in Nepal, in Gorkha, Nepal, which is the epicenter of the 2015 earthquake. Sanjana was just six years old when the earthquake hit. She lost her school, she lost her home, she lost loved ones and friends. Today, she's eight years old, and she spends four hours walking each way from her house to the temporary learning center in the mountains alone, back and forth. That's a total of eight hours walking to get an education. But this education isn't even an education. This temporary learning center is sheet metal, has sheet metal walls hammered together, 30 kids in the space with two textbooks and barely any teachers. She spends most of the day alone, learning with the little bit of content that she has available. She talked to me for a very long time about how all she wants is to learn more, gain more information, Sadly, the system set up for Sanjana is one where she won't be reaching her full potential. Sadly, Sanjana is not alone in this. There's over 263 million children out of school, let alone those who don't have access to a quality education. And this number is climbing drastically by the day. This is an emergency. 
it is predicted that by 2030, 60% of the global GDP will be people from emerging markets only if we can educate them today, which currently is not happening. Again, access to education is an emergency. So what are we doing about this? So we have designed the JARA unit. The JARA unit is an offline education device preloaded with 13 years of geographically custom curriculum. This device works independent of electrical grids, generators, or even the internet. It charges using crank power and solar power. And the solar cells are on the back, so each child can get their own of these, and they won't have to be dependent on any infrastructure. The content of it ranges from the maths and sciences and languages in their mother tongue native language all the way to practical curriculum for community development like how to build a plumbing system with the resources around you in Western Nepal or how to build a clean water system with the resources around you in South Sudan. Furthermore, this device is extremely durable, waterproof, dustproof, breakproof, and heatproof to withstand any environmental conditions. There's many other humanitarian development organizations out there that work on education, but they don't work on the full circle of the system. Full circle of the system means that they're in it for life. They're, in, they're invested in each child for life. What we're doing is we're partnering with local organizations to ensure that we can give the students certifications and diplomas for completing curriculum on this device. <laughs> so we are backed by six years of Stanford research proving the solution to be effective in addition to research we just concluded in Nepal. One of the most exciting parts of what we're doing is we're making this scalable by creating a very low cost device. We're designing these to be $5 in manufacturing and assembly so that we can sell them at $15 to $20 price points, which is something that can be easily accessible. We're selling them to governments, education ministries, and NGOs. Again, access to education is an emergency right now. So for all the Sanjanas in the world, for all of the children whose childhoods have been taken away from them because they have to, sp they have to spend the day working instead of playing and learning, please join us. Please join the JARA journey. Thank you. Soraya, there was like a consensus when, when they were judging yours, and everybody was so happy for, to have you here today. Thank so you. Thank it's you an so honor much. To be here. Thank you so thank much you. for coming. And I'm sure there's questions here in the audience and people here who'd like to get involved in whatever capacity because you've made it so accessible for so many people. So thank you for. Yeah putting Thank your you efforts so into much. something so wonderful. Thank you. Um, Sorry, can I see? Questions from this side? No? Thank you. Yes. This is, so this is one of our prototypes. And we're here today um, looking for support, um, funding support, so that we can turn this into a manufacturable product that we can mass scale. It's not a working prototype yet, right? It is working. Um, Solar right. panel? Pardon? Solar panel. Oh, the so, so it's uh, working. It just uses a different charging source than the crank and solar. But this is the one we've been bringing out to test regions. And where, are you, where are you planning to manufacture? Yes, yeah, so that's something that we're currently exploring. Our priority is manufacturing this ethically, especially in terms of human labor. And we're not going to budge in terms of ethical manufacturing. So we're very open to learning about what resources do you guys know about that do ma ethical manufacturing. We've been talking to an abundance of people so that we can narrow down where is best for us to do this. And even we're considering doing having local, uh, local hubs manufacturing these on site. Two questions, how much yes. money are you looking for and what's the Stanford research about? Would you mind summarizing it? Yes, thank you. Um, so we're looking for $1.5 million. This would bring us um, to our pre-pilot pilot launch in three regions of the world and the Stanford research itself. Um, so the Stanford research was about what are the effects of offline education devices in underserved regions, especially when the education is gamified. The education that we're creating is all gamified too. And uh, for example, the more content that a child completes, they get points, and then they can cash in the points in, in the device to play games too. So it incentivizes the use of the device on top of the education. Because one thing we've learned is a lot of people, especially in you know, disaster zones, refugee camps, they are bored, they want to learn firstly. 
beyond that, they love games and they love playing. So those putting those two things hand in hand creates a full system that people will enjoy. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, more questions. We have any more on the side? Fida? Um, can we get the mic? Mm -hmm. Just hold, hold on a sec. Would you be looking for distribution partners, uh, partners in certain countries uh, w having to deal with refugee crisis where they can place an order, for example, of um, 500, 700,000 uh, of those machines, pay for them, help in um, uh, create the content, the educational content on them, or is it just uh, equity investment? That oh, we're looking for? for everything you mentioned. We would love the partnerships there. For us, we believe we're all stronger together as a world, and this is going to be a whole world undertaking. So the more partners in this, the better. Definitely hook you up. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Ajayta. All day. So I do want to make sure we emphasize this piece. Um, so you know, because you're also prototyping and also market testing and content building at the same time, um, you also welcome grant funding to do R and D, yes. so that you can actually be able to do deeper testing and take larger risks, right? Exactly, yes. Thank you for clarifying that too. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Priya. Somebody can give her the mic, please. Thank you. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you for the... Uh, hi, uh, uh, thank you for doing what you're doing, first of all. It's amazing. Uh, I have a hardware background. Uh, I set up uh, Arduino's office in India and I've been uh, involved with open source hardware like pretty much like since my college times. So what you're mentioning is a very good fit for an open source project. Uh, and uh, if you base it off like Arduino like uh, as a uh, as, as a back end, I mean the the source code is good and it's very well maintained. Uh, it's easier to scale. Uh, and uh, it's it's easier to get it uh, locally manufactured instead of just having one point of uh, sales. You could like just just uh, get it manufactured near Nepal or you know get it assembled inside there. So uh, setting up a hardware company in India, it is uh, uh, it, it is more expensive to import a full assembled system rather than just import the parts and uh, assemble it uh, locally. So uh, yeah, a distributed manufacturing with open hardware. I'm happy to talk Thank offline. Thank you so much. I would yeah. love to chat further. Thank okay. you. I used hey. to actually design um, design and assemble my own Arduinos back in college. So I'd love to chat about that too. Fantastic. <laughs> Any more comments? One more. Just a question. Yes. yes. Because I know this is for you know humanitarian areas. We talked yesterday. You know disaster areas. So is this all going to be like donor funded? Is, is that how the business model works? Oh, so no, we, ha we have a whole business model around this. So we're going to be selling these at three times the price point of manufacturing and assembly. In addition to, we'll be selling our educational platform as a software as a service. To who? Um, so we'll be selling those with sim similar customers or whatever new customers come from, you know, increased awareness of what we're doing. So, um, so, so, sorry, sorry, just, please, um, yes. just, just to ask. Yes. When you say customers, you mean people on the ground in these areas? So the customers and the users are different for us. Okay. Okay. Um, we want to ensure that this can be fully accessible, um, so the customers are separate from the users. So who are the customers? Yes, education ministries, governments, NGOs, and whatever other Okay, so it's either B2B or B2G, basically? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Can I, sorry, Annie, before we move on, One just more, yes, go ahead. Back on that. Who have you been speaking to then so far? Yes, in terms um, for which aspects? From governments. Have you actually been speaking to any particular governments at the moment? Have you um, so we've been talking to um, we've been talking to leaders within Nepal, firstly, um, and overall, generally, everyone's very very excited for us to make this a reality with them in Nepal to start with. Um, we're starting. We're looking to start in Nepal because it's one of the safest and easiest places for us to implement this. Yet the environmental conditions are also harsh. So. If we can make something work in Nepal, we can make it work anywhere. So it's a great place for us to start. So Nepal, yes, but if you are connected with anyone else within governments or education ministries that you think we should talk to, we would love to talk to them. Are you, are you working with, or have you talked to the, the UN and, and as well as the Chowdhury Foundation in Nepal? Have you spoken to them yet? Not yet, we would uh, love to. Yeah, uh, I'll link you up. Thank you very much. Awesome, excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank Sarai. you very much, it's Thank been an honor. Thank you. So for, for those of you who've been with us for the past two hours, there's one more pitch left. Um, I wanted to thank all of you for being with us here today. There's so many women entrepreneurs that came from all over the world and our investors here who have given their time and they've also taken almost a, a whole day off, some of you have, to, to be with us. Um, it's been, it's been a, a dream to do this and I came to Sharjah one year ago um, 
and uh, the dream was even longer than this. It was probably 18 months ago with Amir bin Karam. We talked about this, about doing something like this, and uh, I really didn't know where this was going to go a year ago. But I'm, I'm so thrilled that it's really happening, and it gives me such great uh, satisfaction that you're all here with us today. And uh, I spoke with Lena, and she said, you know, when we do this, when we do this session, we don't want to make it a competition. We want everybody to feel like they're going to get some feedback and, and participate and really give them access to capital. But on, a s on the same note, I know that you've all made an investment in coming here, in being with us, in giving your time. And I know wh how difficult it has, it has been building my own company, Women Investing in Women Digital. We, I self-funded this initially with a million dollars of my own money and raised some external capital. And I know how difficult it is for some of you who are just starting off and I always said that when I get to a position where when I'm able to invest, I will absolutely be investing in other women entrepreneurs. And we do this both through our capital, but we also do this through the media platform that we've built. And I'm, I'm pleased to share today that each of the finalists today, we would like to do a feature on you in the World Women Report and feature you on our social media. We've got about a million followers on, on uh, Facebook at the moment. So if you haven't joined, please join. Love to share your stories, your content. We're, we're really built this platform for you. And uh, in the World Women Report, there is an aggregated distribution now of 115 million viewers across 50 shared content partners around the world focused on women entrepreneurs and investors. We also have the State of Women Radio Network that's produced and broadcasted by 16 to 23 year old girls. So they Skype interview women entrepreneurs like yourselves, and I'm sure they'd be blown away by your stories as much as we have here today. So really, this is a gift to you. Um, the value is close to $70,000, $5,000 each uh, of, of services that we're, we're going to put on the table. Um, it wasn't something that I could announce initially, but we've waited to, to announce this, and there'll be one more announcement at the end once we finish this. But we really want to keep you all connected to what we're building, what we're about to build, <coughs> and the last thing that I wanted to share with you today is that we have been commissioned to make the world's first film on women entrepreneurs and investors from the emerging markets. So we started filming last week in India at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit where I met Ajaita. And we, we got interviews from women from Afghanistan, from Bangladesh, from Bhutan, uh, from China, Palestine, you name it. Like we've been covering as many women as we could for the past two weeks, uh, Prime Minister Modi, we got Jade Nayan. So we got some really great content and we're going to release this film on International Women's Day next year, March 8th, 2018, worldwide release. 25 minute film for schools, classrooms, universities. The women who pitched here today are going to be in this film and we hope that it'll go to the schools and classrooms to inspire other young women and girls and, and, and spread this message of entrepreneurship and investing and you can do it if you have the confidence. So I just wanna thank all of you for having the faith in me to come here, the investors who gave your time today, you know what that means to me and all the other young women that are going to be <laughs> seeing this film. So thank you so much. We're gonna reach about 2 billion viewers. That's our goal. So thank you so much. And if there's any way that we can partner with you and help your initiative, I've got three portfolio companies here today and I hope to add some more. So thank you so much and you know we have big plans and we want you to be a part of them. Um, also considering doing the world's first women entrepreneur index that I'm, I'm working on right now at the moment. So if some of you are looking for capital, please do talk to me and I'm happy to connect you with our resources. And uh, if there's any other way that we can support you, please let us know, we're here for you. And without further ado, I want to introduce one of my portfolio companies, this is Matter. Thank you, Neil. Thank yes, you. Thank, thank you. you very much. To get my clicker, and I have prototypes to share at the end, so um, or to show rather. I wish I had gifts, um, but yes. So um, here we go. The last presentation. Thank you all. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur with a startup, which means no one escapes being around me without having to hear about my business. So I was at the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas, and the housekeeper there, um, <laughs> Delia, got to hear about my business. So I said, I'm the inventor. <laughs> I think she might have asked, but she didn't have to. I would have told her anyway. Uh, I said, I'm the inventor of a device that helps women strengthen the pelvic floor. 
and the pelvic floor is more commonly thought of as the muscles of the vagina. And um, when these muscles are weak, women suffer, and they suffer from things like bladder leakage. And um, so she told me that she has bladder leakage, which I expected because the numbers are very, very high. It's two out of three women. But what I didn't expect is what she told me next, which is she said when she's at work, she tries not to laugh with the other housekeepers when everyone's joking around because she doesn't want to pee her pants at work. And that broke my heart. And when you look at these numbers, when you see how many women have bladder leakage, how many women suffer from organ prolapse, how many women have sexual dysfunction from weak muscles, then you realize how many women are holding back from doing things like exercise, dancing, intimacy, laughter. So the stakes are high if we continue to ignore this. And it starts young. I bet most people here were thinking, that's an older woman problem, that's a menopause thing. It starts very, very young. And that means women are suffering for the majority of their life, if we do nothing. Now, there are some services out there, and we know this is market validation. Women are suffering, so they're turning to these types of things. They're turning to incontinence pads and spending about $2 billion a year on it, and they're getting surgeries that are very dangerous, and that's what got me involved. My mother had some of those surgeries and was injured by them. A lot of uh, international courts have decided they do more harm than good. And they don't solve the root problem. What does solve the root problem is exercise, simply exercise. But what we know from medical studies is women don't do them correctly or often enough. So we just have to solve for that. The solution is not incontinence pads and not surgery, it's exercise. So if we can get women to exercise less often because they're told to exercise three to five times a day, if we can give them perfect form so they do it correctly and get all the benefits, then we get them to do a super kegel. And then they have treatment and prevention of all those problems I showed you. We know this. We've known this for a long time. So this is the product I invented. I call it the Kegel Bell, and it's a vaginal weight system. This exists to a certain degree. What's patent pending internationally about this one is that it's external weight, which means it's five times, six times greater than the weight on the market, and it's all externally held. I can go into detail about what makes it unique and exceptional, but I can tell you that we sold out of the beta. And the uh, traction that we have is that our customers have now driven all of our wins. So from our customer base, we have strategic alliance with the manufacturer, our investors come from our customer base, our FDA help comes from our customer base. In fact, um, if you want customer testimonials, first round of customers are doing all of these things for the company. So that's our team. Our team is women who love the product and said, how can I help? And this is the core team here. And we're all working for free. And so far, it's pretty much been bootstrapped. We just had a round of investors, and it was fantastic. These are all delightful women for whom I can't wait to write a bigger check to. And uh, so doctor, uh, the doctor of engineering you see there who's in Germany, he had a product in Intimate Health that sold $30 million worth in two years. So what we're looking at is in two years, we should exceed that because of the uh, this type of product that we have here, and that's just one channel, and we have the same retail channel that he has. So our roadmap is that one product, but we have a whole line of products that I've invented, many of which are patent pending internationally, and I'd be happy to share the details of that with anyone who's interested in knowing more. So what, what Stephanie has is a patent portfolio, if I'm not mistaken, okay. correct? That's a fair way and, of saying it. And Kathy Sachs, the other woman that was listed on there, was my very first investor. I went to a lunch meeting with her. We talked about life and just future and what we thought about investing in women. And before the end of the lunch, she agreed to sign me a check. She said, I didn't mm -hmm. even read the rest of your document. I just read your term sheet. I want to invest in you. And she made it so seamless. So I promised I wanted to be their first investor. So this is a solid. I know these people. They're really good. They're from Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And when I said, look, you've been selected, she just got so excited and booked her flights and came out to Dubai. So it's, I hope this trip has been uh, productive for you and Very much learning so. about this market and Very you know, much so. what are you looking for specifically right now? Yes, what I'm looking for is uh, affiliates and partners because we're global, we're going global. And we have, I have a medical agent here in the region who's looking at being, you know, distributing for us. And we have an e-commerce play in the United States and we have specialty retailers in Europe. And 
I'm working on different types of relationships in Cambodia, Madagascar. So we need to, you can tell from the sensitivity of this topic and the taboo nature, that when it's presented in a given locale, it has to be presented, marketed, and distributed, and the go-to market is going to be different in each region. And since I can't specialize in all of that, the idea is to have partners and affiliates who can run with it and do a beautiful job in their local community. And we also have a modified version that's also part of the patent, which makes for um, a very cheap uh, production and distribution to the developing world. So it's definitely important. If you can imagine in the developing world where you don't have incontinence pads, and you can imagine being punished in the home, or ostracized or alienated from having things like incontinence and organ prolapse, it's really important to get this treatment and prevention as, as far and wide as possible. And I give the Kegel Bell example just to show you how we solve for problems, how we scan the landscape, look at what taboo and or big businesses may have fallen down in the past, how it can be disruptive, and we do this again and again and again with different facets of women's health and wellness. Excellent. More questions? Questions? Can you share what the products are? Yes, yes. Um, Koda, you want to go next after this? Yeah, okay. I would love to. <laughs> bringing so him out. I'm working with <laughs> please. He's bringing him out. <laughs> I'm working with a manufacturer in, um, in Hong Kong who's FDA registered and who's been working with the engineer on that product that sold 30 million in, in, um, in two years. So, and, and so this is the insert, mm -hmm. okay? And there is a urologist at Beverly Hills Cedar Sinai in California who's a brilliant researcher, and she and her team are gonna study this. So originally I had this insert size mm -hmm. as part of the deal, and she said she wants two insert sizes to study, because she's gonna study this for more benefits. And uh, so the women could start maybe with a larger size, then graduate up to the smaller size, or maybe they start right away with the smaller size. The kit means that it meets them wherever they're at. Uh, because you don't have to ask yourself if you need it. Everyone needs the prevention. Most people could use the treatment. It helps you regardless of age. Mm -hmm. So the thing is we have four weights that interchange novelly and kind of like this Russian nesting doll, okay? And what happens is the woman has 16 steps of weights, so in one, um, in one ounce increments, she can go up to a pound of weight, okay? And so this part's outside the body, and this part's inside the body. And she just uses it for five minutes, three times a week. And that really matters, because Kegel exercise, women are told to do three to five times a day. It adds up to about 100 minutes, and that's a burden, and they forget. And they also don't have perfect form. A woman has perfect form, just perforce by standing up in the shower. That's how the customers tell me they use it. It's in the shower. And um, by holding it in, they have perfect form. The minute they reach muscle fatigue, it starts to slip out. That's it. So we solve for form and we solve for time. And women trying to integrate into their lifestyle, they told us they use it in the shower. So we made it very clear to the manufacturer this has to be shower proof. And, um, so we have, I don't know, choose your design, but we have another model that I'm pretty excited about, but it's the same thing. And this is the modification, in case you guys are curious. How do you modify this to distribute to, let's say, remote regions in, let's say, Africa or India? Well, you simply, we have this modification where it's a water bottle adapter. Since this part is outside the body, the woman can add a water bottle and simply add water inside the bottle over time to increase the weight. And that is a workaround that is cheap. That this we could distribute uh, very easily. So, um, and when it comes to distribution, it is, you know, if cigarettes can reach people all around the world, this device can reach people all around the world. There like you the go. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Hoda, you had a question? No, I just want to say thank you for addressing a problem that is real problem. And you're right, people don't talk about it because it's taboo and it's all quality of life. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think, something like this affect women after birth. We have an IVF clinic, and I know we're, we're talking about addressing some of those issues. Um, and one of our doctors got the laser machine, and mm -hmm. it supposedly take care of the same mm -hmm. thing. So my question to you, yes. what is the advantage and disadvantage to this compared to the laser machine? I know the price for sure. Yes, the price for sure. <laughs> the <laughs> price. Um, absolutely, great question. 
So there are these lasers that do tiny little cuts inside the, the canal, and the idea is that it puffs up the tissues, and then that creates the bulk of muscle that you're missing when the muscle's weak. And you'd have to go for repeated therapeutic treatments. Well, for one thing, it is very expensive, at least yeah. in the States, it costs thousands of dollars. This kit sells for $99. Um, so that's $3, one thing. Yeah, 3000 3, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing what is, it's actually. invasive, it's a little uncomfortable and embarrassing to go for those treatments. And also, I would argue, if someone's going for lasers, like they're willing to go to do that out of pocket, I would say, go get your lasers and do this. Mm -hmm. You'll be very strong <laughs> and <laughs> definitely get better results. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. We're at 3.58. We're right on time. Ooh, right on time. Right on time. Please, uh, yeah. I just want to put this down for a second. Ugh. And can you, can you hear me? OK. About how long does it take for a woman to see results after using? That is a great question. Thank you. Uh, two weeks. Pretty clear about that. Wow. In two weeks, uh, women will see results starting to occur. If I can be bold and frank with what the results are, they'll start to see an improvement in squeeze uh, fairly immediately, you can imagine. And then they start to see an increase in, um, again, I'm going to be bold here, but we're here to help women with lubrication. And uh, that's very important for the health of the woman and not to use artificial lubricants and be dependent on them. So, and then after that, that's 100% of my customers reported those two benefits, okay? Then after that, it depends on if they're struggling with incontinence or not. If they're struggling with incontinence, they start to see an abatement of symptom. And, and the trajectory is about 12 weeks to get resolution. And then therapeutic use is you, you can go down from five minutes three times a week down to maybe once a week just to maintain the benefit after that point. But I want to say, you saw the slide maybe, one of my customers uh, ran the Iron Man and she said without peeing. <laughs> so she was very ecstatic about that. It's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, comment you coming at your way, Stephanie. Um, Fida, do you want to? We had another? We had another comment? Mm -hmm. Who? Please, Danielle, no? Please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, would insurance companies be interested in a product like that? Because every day I hear of uh, relatives or friends who are going through surgery mm. to solve this problem, mm -hmm. and it costs insurance companies mm. thousands of dollars. So mm -hmm. I think this might be a good fit. And the other thing is I know a um, VC that is looking for mm -hmm. something very close to what you're saying, so I'd love to put you in touch. Please as do. Yeah. Please Thank do. you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. So um, the whole point of this session, when it was conceptualized, was it's an opportunity to grow session. And I hope the entrepreneurs that pitched today, you got some valuable feedback and um, some good comments in terms of directing you, in terms of what you can do to imp uh, improve and grow your businesses. Um, I'm going to ask the judges if they had any more final comments before we leave today for any of the entrepreneurs. I know you had something with, with, with regards to Metalac. Did you, Metalac, the first company, Fida? Yeah, can you, can, you, can you get our mic, please? Thank you. I'll just put you both in touch with the same VC. OK, great. So that she, you've got someone that Fida wants to t talk to you about. Uh, Anvita, did you have any companies that you wanted to speak with after, specifically? Yeah, there are some. I, and I'm kind of really impressed with okay. you know, some of the models. I will let you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Please yeah. do that. Virginia, did you, did you want to say something was our surprise about our surprise? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, uh, very honored uh, to be here, very privileged to hear um, all these fantastic women pitch. Actually, um, a real inspiration uh, for me to, to remember why we built She Loves Tech and why we're now building the Gender Lens Fund as well. It's a very, very powerful reminder. Um, I'd like to uh, you know, offer um, every year for She Loves Tech, we don't just do like a round in each country. Um, we actually offer the winners of each round to come to China uh, for the full week of boot camp and we take them to, to visit all these large Chinese companies um, and then we also get them to pitch or to speak at our big conference so this year um, our big conference was just uh, we had a million people looking just uh, looking at it in a live stream uh, in, in China you know and then that's not even that big for China so mm -hmm. so I actually love to uh, offer you know um, one person from this competition uh, you know the chance to go to, to come to China next year uh, and um, should I announce it right now or should I, can I just say it Go later? Ahead. 
You can uh, say it now. Sure. Uh, I'd love to uh, offer this to uh, Frontier Markets. Um, India is actually a place uh, very close to my heart. I actually go to Rajasthan once a year. I, I do, actually. She's on her way next February. We're supposed to come. Where, 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 where do you? Oh, really? I, I'm actually going to Rajasthan on my birthday. next. I, I, I go there once a year on my birthday. So uh, I, I'd love to uh, invite you to uh, participate in the boot camp and potentially even to speak at the conference because we want to bring in a lot more international speakers to show, um, you know, uh, you know in, in China to showcase this. I think that's really, really powerful. The Chinese themselves are incredible entrepreneurs. The kinds of, um, you know, the, the, the strides that we see, you see young women not even 30 years old, they're raising, you know, uh, 50, 100 million dollars. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. So I would, uh, I, I know, I, and also I would like to talk more about, about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. And she's got a microfinance, you've got a microfinance background, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I do. Yes, okay. Perfect. All right, Marie? That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I, I was honestly very impressed with uh, the quality and caliber of people that, that came and, and um, put in the effort and presented. Each and every one of you, I don't want to name names because I don't want to miss out. Um, each and every one of you has been impressive and left a mark with me personally, and I've learned from you. Um, and honestly, uh, regardless of where you are in your on your pathway to, to launch your business, whether you're established business or you're still an idea. Um, you, you all are honestly, I'm envious of you. I'm envious of your passion. And I'd love to see you all succeed. And if I can be helpful at all, and I will be reaching out to a few of you, but if you feel like there's something that I can be um, uh, useful at and help you personally with, I'm more than happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Heba, thank you for joining us. <laughs> It's been an honor and a pleasure. And I think sitting here on the panel, we have learned so much from, from you guys. You have demonstrated what the spirit of being an entrepreneur is. So thank you. Um, I was going to suggest why, if it's okay with the um, fellow judges, if we can share our profiles. Absolutely. So we will share that. We will share that with them. Because everybody has their own sort of network. And we'll put your, is it okay if we list your contact in for your email at least? Is that okay? Email yeah. is all right? Yeah. Just give me, and, yeah. and there, we can create a Facebook group as well, we c whatever yeah. you're comfortable with. Because there were so many ideas going through my mind and yep. people that I can connect to other people, et cetera, you know, potential investors, potential government bodies, et cetera, that might be helpful. And so We'll create a Women Investing yeah. Women MENA group. And those yeah. of you who don't want to be on, I know all of you on Facebook pretty much, so I'll add you one by one and, and some of the contestants. So those of you that don't want to be on there, just remove yourself. And then you'll you'll be connect connected to whoever you want to connect to. But I think we're building out a community here, and there's more women that could possibly engage with us. Yeah. So yeah. Please reach out, and congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Hoda. I'm not going to repeat what all my um, colleagues said. I will add to say, Anu, thank you so much for making this platform available for everyone. It's really great. Thank you. Um, you're also a role model to all entrepreneurs, so you, you worked a lot hard to get where you are, and it's it's great to for Thank all you. these women to see that role model. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that you know all of you were so passionate, and it's amazing. You have the recipe for success, and I think you will make it. Good luck, and if I can be of any help, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. Have a. Um, thank you so much for having me. I mean, I don't want to repeat what everyone said, as you said, but uh, it was super inspiring to see you all, not because of just your ideas and how they make sense financially, but actually almost every single business had a sustainable element or an element that was giving back or some doing something f socially that was good, but also in a way that made business sense, which I found to be extremely uh, inspiring and was the highlight of this session for me personally. So yeah, I mean, uh, if you guys can see, I will reach out personally to a few people, but again, when you share my profile, anyone can reach out to me as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sadaf? One more time. One, one second. Oh, uh, I think this has been incredible. I've been walking in and out, and I'm personally very inspired. I'm a social entrepreneur myself. I uh, was a pioneer in bringing microfinance to Pakistan. We grew it from two rooms and took it to 300,000 women, wow. dispersing $200 million. Uh, we were 70 members and then scaled it to 2,000. 40% were women who were working with us. So it broke 
barriers in many ways, both in terms of women's employment, women leading an institution. We were ranked amongst the top 50 by Forbes. So I'd be happy to share uh, you know, experiences on scaling, growth, uh, with the women over here. But the second offer really is that we've just launched today with NAMA. Uh, I, I later uh, set up a social enterprise circle which, where the goal is to increase women's participation in the economy. And we have been mobilizing CEOs in Pakistan to commit to gender diversity, bringing women on boards, leadership, women businesses into supply chains. We've got Unilever, Reckitt, Standard Chartered, Phenomenal. UBL who've committed. And we're now uh, bringing that to UAE and then scaling it with NAMA to the MENA region. Phenomenal. So this will open up many opportunities for us to connect startups with these businesses and to also have some of these companies mentor women. Thank you. So I'd love to make that offer Absolutely. available. And Anu, incredible work. Uh, one of my big messages uh, when I was speaking was also that we need more women supporting women. We need to celebrate each other's success. We need to feel good, have an abundance and growth mindset. And you're demonstrating that. And I hope all the startups and us together Thank can you. build an ecosystem where we support each Stronger other. Stronger together. And hats off to having a, a, a panel of judges, which is all women. I love that. All women investors. Yes, this all is, women investors because yes. we don't see that. We need no. to change that too. Absolutely. And they're from all over the world. We, we were so intentional. Um, does any final comments from anyone else would like to share? There's Hoda and then back there. No? Anyone else? Virginia, one more. And then anyone else? Okay, great. Ajaita, also great. So Hoda, and Virginia, and then Ajaita. Just, okay. just forgot to make a comment that what really amazing when you're in a women environment and when you listen to women is how much we focus on making a difference, impact, yeah. and, and being good. And this is amazing. It really makes you feel good and it's very important. One recommendation I would say to you and also to me and all of us, we need to learn, learn to do good, but we need to do to learn to do well, which means in your pitches in the future, focus more on how you can make money. Uh, it's very important what you're doing, uh, and it, it touched emotionally, but you need, you need to address the whole population. You're addressing the woman, which is 50% of your client and your potential investor. To address the 100% of the people you want to serve, try to speak the other language of how we make good and how we make money. So focus a little bit more. That's really women, great advice. Women investing. Also, women invest not just because of the emotion, they invest because of the financial returns. Like you yourselves are involved with the businesses because of the financial returns alongside the impact, so. Virginia, yeah. and then Ajaita. And if there's anyone else, just last chance, last uh, chance. M my comment is really <laughs> about you, actually. Um, I I'm proud to be here because you convened all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think what you did today, you know, just set a role model for all of us in terms of not just talking about supporting others, but actually supporting others. Thank and I you. think that the, one of the most powerful things that you can do for somebody else, whether men or women, is to open the door. You know, just open the door for someone. And you did that for a lot of us here today. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Honored. Ajaita. Ajaita. Uh, can we get her a mic, please? It's coming, two seconds. The world needs to hear this. <laughs> so I just wanted to quickly say, I'm gonna come over here and say it. Um, the Global Enterprise Summit this year was about women first prosperity for all, right? That was a theme. And it was a theme about, you know, US entrepreneurs, Indian entrepreneurs, global entrepreneurs coming together to celebrate this. And, um, you know, someone asked me, what does that mean? And I met Anu like, even before I won, and she literally just was like, you need to be scaled. There needs to be a support network that makes this happen. And literally like two days later, I'm on a flight, I'm in Dubai, and I'm meeting the most incredible women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that I would have the liberty to like really bond with and get to know. And I gotta tell you, I was like, I literally saw her earlier today. I was like, how did you know this? She goes, that's my skill set. And I think it's so important for all of us to recognize our skill sets so that we can actually start helping each other in a very different way. Like my skill set is selling all of these lovely women. And I'm telling you right now, like I will do it. Like that bear I'm selling for the world. Um, <laughs> but also, I mean, I think we all learned about each other's skill sets today um, and getting to know that there's such an incredible network of opportunity. So I wanted to like on behalf of all of us, also thank you for giving us the platform and the opportunity. You're an amazing woman. Thank you. And I think you're all amazing women. And that I think we're all gonna really change things to a really financial successful way as well as impact. So thank you. Thank you.
It's the she economy. <laughs> We're here. The future is female. What else can I say? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all being here. And this is just the beginning. We got this.